2022-04 for the record. We're opening up the budget session today. We will first stand in an invocation by Mr. Bush, please, and then we'll stay standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, we are able to uh, be here today. Lord, I'd ask that you would bless each uh, member that's here on the Board of Supervisors and also those that are be participating. Lord, uh, we uh, invoke your presence to this meeting today. We'd ask that you would bless this time. Again, bless each one of the Board of Supervisors members and be with all of us, Lord, that in everything that we do, we can realize that um, we are serving not only this county, and uh, but we're also serving you. Lord, we thank you for the, the time that we're able to um, meet together like this. And we're thankful for the way in which the Board of Supervisors is so conscientious about serving this county and the needs of the county. Please be with them, give them clarity, and uh, give them wisdom. And it's through Christ that we pray. Amen. Mr. Rosati, can you do the presentation? Yep, ready to go. That it was you and Ms. Cobb. Okay. Um, if we go to the first slide there, the fiscal years and the fund balance, uh, what I've done, I went back 10 years of your audit history and reviewed uh, the information so I could get a better grasp of uh, how you got to where you're at today. And uh, so I'll be commenting on some of those things. And quite frankly, as I've been going to lunch here for the past six weeks or ever how long I've been here, uh, a lot of residents who either worked in Westmoreland County and lived in King George or somehow they all recognize me. So I'm going to have to get a mask when I go to lunch from now on. Uh, so they've had a lot of uh, questions. A lot of it has surrounded the fund balance and they don't understand why taxes are going up when you have so much money. So I'm going to touch upon that. So perhaps everybody can gain a better understanding. Then we're going to get into the actual uh, uh, recommended budget and discuss those items specifically. In this first slide, what we've done is to show you uh, how much uh, of the fund balance in four of those years have been used. And back in 2018 and 19, I guess that would have been probably during the COVID period uh, that uh, there was not much of that used. And I'm assuming it was because of the federal funds and so forth that were supplied to the localities across the Commonwealth. Okay, if we go to the next slide, I'm trying to explain, everybody has a little bit different definition of what a fund balance is. And I know a lot of the average constituents often think of the fund balance in context uh, with their own personal finances, like a checking account and so forth. But unfortunately, government doesn't operate as simply as, uh, as your checking account does. So uh, a fund balance is not like keeping cash in your uh, personal checking account. Uh, what the fund balance is, is used as governmental accounting is the difference between the assets and liabilities, and it either results in a surplus or a deficit. Fortunately, everywhere I've ever worked, I've never had a deficit, so I've never had to worry about that. Uh, but a common uh, misconception is the fund balance is a cash account, which you're gonna see a little presentation as we get along here. The government fund balance is not really a cash account, but it's simply a measure of equity between the revenues and expenditures of the jurisdiction. Uh, governmental accounting uh, is somewhat unique. 
and it requires a separate uh, self-balancing account entries uh, for each of the funds uh, that the county has. Now, I know that the, some of the discussions in the past meetings, and Levita can maybe touch on this, although in the accounting system, some of these are listed as separate funds, the auditors only report basically your general fund, capital improvement fund, and then the service authority funds. So those others, which we will show here in one of the sections from the audit, uh, are really just part of the county's general fund and just basically set aside, which we'll touch on here shortly. Um, a locality's ability to use unassigned fund balance can be seen as a tool for basically uh, maintaining stable tax rates. Uh, a strong fund balance allows the locality to deal with negative economic uh, trends in unforeseen circumstances. And maintaining the appropriate level of fund balance will lessen the current and future risk to ensure uh, a stable cash flow. Um, for example, I guess most of you probably either heard on the news or so forth that inflation basically has been reported rather significantly. So that not only affects each of us going to the grocery store, but it'll affect the the all the various departments here in dealing with the purchases of uh, fuel and all the items that they purchase. An adequate fund balance basically allows the government to maintain a stable level of public services throughout the entire budget cycle. And uh, due to the varying cash flow cycles for uh, tax and other revenue collections, uh, one example that comes to my mind is a lot of the grants and some loans that the localities receive is the county has to advance that money first. We have to pay the bill, then submit for reimbursement. Like VRA loans, uh, Virginia Resource Authority, a lot of those you pay, then you apply for the uh, refund. Uh, the state compensation board pays in arrears. Uh, and that's just a way a lot of these uh, uh, operations of the state government work. And I know we've experienced in Westmoreland, we had some of the hurricanes, FEMA, especially at the landfill, where you'd accept a lot of debris after a hurricane and so forth, uh, it would be four years before you would get reimbursed. So if you didn't have the money to upfront that, you'd have to go, I guess, borrow the money. Unfortunately, I've never worked anywhere where that has had been the case. So those are some examples. It helps even out the cash flow and is very helpful in that. So a strong uh, fund balance will allow the county to meet its cash flow needs, complete scheduled projects, and provide a contingency in case of an emergency or disruption in revenues and so forth. For example, uh, I guess I'm assuming you experienced the same thing we did in Westmoreland that during COVID that kind of upset the whole apple cart. And so fortunately it was very convenient to have a fund balance to deal with all those things because there was no certainty about uh, receiving funds from the federal government and so forth. So a lot of those items had to be purchased with local funds prior to uh, the CARES Act and the American uh, Relief Fund. Uh, the one question that people often ask is how much fund balance should the local government retain? Well, there's no, really no one answer to this question. It depends on each individual government. Uh, King George County's policy is basically 15%, which most that's the same in Westmoreland. Some governments have a higher threshold, 20%, 25, see it high as 30. Uh, but it really depends on the needs of, of the locality to have those uh, funds uh, set aside. So, uh, and we'll touch upon that. I'll actually do the numbers for you here in a slide as we move forward. Okay, one of the things that during my analysis and <clears throat> working with Levita, uh, some of the prior year budgets uh, did not include an allowance uh, in the real estate and personal property items for delinquencies. So basically, we were overstating the actual amount of revenue uh, that would be collected, which end up creating a problem uh, at the end of the road. So, uh, so those are just some examples I've sh shown you there, what we've had to 
adjust, but that's an actual variance to the budget. Also, in the public service taxes, uh, we're budgeted at two more two million dollars, uh, rather than the seven hundred ninety-seven thousand nine fifty-eight. So that was resulting in a basically a one point two million dollar variance. Uh, basically, the commissioner of revenue and uh, the county administrator usually receive those assessments from the state corporation commission in late August. So it's well after you have your budget done. I personally always just utilize the number from the previous year. And if it went up, great. Uh, and I think only one year did it ever uh, decrease uh, during my 30 years and what's more. Uh, so it's kind of an awkward process, them giving you numbers that far after your budget is completed. But unfortunately, that's the way it works. Also, the state recordation tax, uh, which the state law requires either to be spent on transportation costs or education uh, was budgeted $80,310 for the last several years. And back in April of 20, uh, the state tax department notified all local jurisdictions uh, that basically that money due to legislation that was changed to send the money all to Hampton Roads Sanitation, or not Sanitation, Hampton Roads Transportation District. Uh, would be receiving the entire sum. And so the rural localities and other localities around the Commonwealth uh, would no longer receive those funds. Uh, then also I noticed in the budget that the personal property uh, relief act funds were not subtracted off of the uh, revenue estimates for vehicles. And so uh, that was basically double counting that money because Basically, you know, when you get your personal property tax bill for those vehicles that qualify, that money is being applied. So you don't pay the full amount and that. So that unfortunately was offsetting as well and uh, giving an error. So why these occurred or whatever, I, I can't tell you the answer to that. But we've tried to, Lavine and I work very hard to try to get this to be an accurate uh, revenue estimate so that we can move forward. Okay, if we go to the next slide, this is basically <clears throat> showing the changes in the fund balance, uh, and it's taken directly from uh, last year's audit. Uh, and some of the things that it's a little hard to see there, but if you come down to show the excess deficiency of revenues over expenditures, uh, in the last 10 years, there was only three years that it was positive. Now, this is all funds. This is not exclusively the general fund. It's all funds combined. Uh, but then if you go down under that, you see the transfers that are, are transferred from either the capital improvement fund or one of the other set aside funds, uh, then to give you what the net change is in the uh, fund balance. And the next page is just the remaining five years to bring us up through uh, 2023. So we're, we're going to work very hard. There's some other things that uh, I think the county can do. And uh, I've been working with LaVita. And hopefully uh, when your uh, new county administrator shows up, we can work and help explain some of these things to try to get a better alignment of uh, between the revenues and expenditures for the locality. Yes. Uh, that's not necessarily out of the, uh, it's unfortunately the way it's been set up here in the past, you've created a lot of funds where you're transferring money to, for example, the stabilization fund from the general fund. Then when you need it, you transfer it back. It's just creating a lot more entries for LaVita and her staff. Most jurisdictions simply appropriate from the fund balance. And because the more times you're transferring stuff, the higher probability that there's a mistake going to be made. But some of it is transferred from your capital fund. Then what was that other fund that I asked you about? The, yeah, the debt mitigation fund. I guess that came from the general fund that it was originally. Yeah, and, and we're trying to figure out what, nobody knows what it's for. So we're trying to uh, figure out uh, what the directive was at the time that the Board of Supervisors did this to 
figure our way forward. So, so I'm not sure what it was funded by, but originally I was told that it was meant to pay down the principal on some of the debt. Uh, that could be. I can't tell you because I haven't seen the document yet of what what was outlined. Uh, okay. If you go to the next slide, uh, the general fund undersigned balance. We can, Chris, can you scroll up a little bit? I had a good. Okay. Uh, this basically. Uh, shows the uh, general fund on a side balance from 2014 to 2023. So it has been going up. I believe there was only one year that I recall in the audit where it actually decreased. And uh, I believe it was 2018 or nine, I can't remember. It was one of those years where it decreased. But most other years, uh, the fund balance actually uh increased okay uh, one of the uh this is taken from the audit to, to help further explain the uh, funds and the people can go online and actually see this you can see it on any jurisdiction one thing i often did is i would get comparable localities to us and pull certain things and put them into spreadsheets for comparison to see if we thought we knew what we're doing or they were doing something better because in government it's not uncommon to steal a good idea and improve upon it uh, basically this sheet taking from the audit explains the fund equity and the categories uh, that uh, how the board reserves funds first you have the non-spendable balance which uh, are things such as inventory, prepaids, and so forth. But then you have the next category is a restricted fund balance. That could be done because of state law. For example, uh, in Westmoreland, we had our own gas pumps. And so DEQ required us to put a bond or escrow for that. Uh, at times we had it uh, when we were closing our landfill. Uh, so things like that, or bonds or, or some higher governmental authority imposes upon you uh, to set aside either a bond proceed or some funds uh, to cover some potential uh, problem. Uh, then you have uh, the committed fund balance. That's basically up to the governing body here to decide uh, what those purposes are that they wish to commit those funds, which we'll see on the next page, how it relates in the most recent audit. Then you have a signed fund balance that's used for specific purposes uh, that can be expressed by the governing body, and only the governing body can change uh, these commitments. Okay, if we go to the next slide. Uh, this is actually shows the numbers of those categories. Uh, the non-spendable, the restricted, uh, the committed. For example, education. There's five hundred one thousand five or four fifty nine. The stabilization fund. Subsequent year expenditures. I assume that's just encumbrances. Is that correct? Okay. And uh, then recreation. It goes through the tourism, debt mitigation, and then eighty nine for thousand for other purposes. Uh, there was no assigned under the capital projects. So you see what your unassigned fund balance was of 39 million, 529, 811. And then your total fund balances include those that are set aside in reserve. And then it shows the capital projects. Uh, and I assume that 41 million was uh, debt proceeds. Yeah, thank you. And uh, either that or somebody won the lottery and was very generous. In that, so uh, then the permanent fund, I believe, isn't that the library fund? Is the what they live? Okay, so so that's really all those are all in the general fund, and that's how they report them because it has to be a uniform reporting uh, to the federal government and everybody else that we have to report this audit to. So. Uh, but actually, it's creating a lot of extra work for LaVita and her staff. So you may want to explore 
try to streamline that in somewhere and use this method, which requires less accounting, fewer mistakes, and it's resulting in the same uh, outcome that you desire. Okay. Um, I guess Jackie thought we couldn't see the small print giving us a second copy. Uh, okay, if you, uh, one of the things in the current budget that we're gonna go over, we started out at I believe $4.3 million over uh, the revenues. So we've had to do quite a bit of uh, trimming and trying to get things uh, where it was somewhat reasonable to deal with. One of the recommendations that I'm gonna make to you is we've pulled these expenditures you see out of the general fund and I'm recommending that you pay those from the ARPA funds. You have, I think several meetings ago was presented, you have funds that are left over from projects that had funds. So I'm recommending that you take 284,798 to cover those expenses and that still leaves you a remaining 397,774. Okay, we'll proceed on. One of the significant factors that's uh, affecting uh, your landfill is, uh, and I spoke with Mike and he's provided me these uh, figures, is that your total tonnages are declining from the peak of about 1800 to 20, uh, 2023, the 1.3 uh, million tons. And that's having an adverse effect on the revenues that, that you all have relied on over the years uh, for your capital improvement fund. Uh, so um, we'll uh, we'll get to that, but we've reduced it to what we think is a more reliable estimate. Uh, but I just wanted to provide that information to you so uh, that you had it. I know that uh, Mike and Mr. Stewart and I are going to meet with the waste management uh, regarding some proposed changes or something that they want to do to the contract. So we'll. Uh, see if uh, something could be done. There's some, some other questions I have about that contract, but uh, we'll have to wait till we get to that point in time. Okay, on the next slide, uh, uh, what the proposed fiscal year general fund budget that we've prepared is 78,754,077. So the, what you do is you take your 15% of that uh, fund total and the 15% reserve policy requirement is $11,786,111. So if you take uh, that number from the unassigned uh, balance from the last fiscal year, that puts you excess above the reserve requirement by 27 million. Okay, if we go to the next slide, uh, this is a, a new form that apparently in the past, uh, King George has not utilized this process. They sort of, I guess, waited till the end of the fiscal year to uh, fix uh, negative balances in line items. And I'm gonna have a meeting with all the department heads. Uh, that to me seems like a quite a risky manner to uh, run a railroad that way. So. Uh, we're gonna pass this out. I think some of the burden has to be on the department that's running their own budget and have responsibility for it. Now, we all know periodically there's times that unanticipated uh, needs that are beyond what the capabilities are, but uh, I, I've used this in every jurisdiction that I've worked and the department heads and so forth were very cooperative and if there's a time that you know, something happens where they have to come back to you for a supplemental appropriation. Usually it's something significant that could not have been anticipated and so forth. But this helps the finance department rather than waiting till the end of the year. And what has happened in my discussions with um, Levita in, in reviewing some of the documents, we rely on taking leftover 
uh, vacancy savings and, and other money uh, to fix everybody else's budget problem. And uh, hopefully Chief Moody will have uh, a situation where he won't have a lot of vacancies. And so you can't simply keep relying on this as a means to solve a problem. Most localities that, that I'm familiar with, they create a contingency account in the general fund to, to deal with that. And that can be of current year revenues that you're raising, or it can be a, from a fund balance to, so that those things, when they happen, then you come back to the board to explain what the issue is, and then you address it. So uh, we will be meeting with all the department folks to try to help streamline this, and rather than uh, let it go on to the end of the year, then run around trying to figure out how to solve the problem, there doesn't seem to me to be a reasonable uh, manner to approach this because the budget control report needs to be out to the department heads. There's a way, at least under the current software, that they can actually go out online and look at it. They can't enter any data, anything, but they can see the most updated information when the finance department is processing payroll, accounts payable, uh, so that they have that information in their decision making. One other item I've been working with the treasurer on uh, in the finance department, we are going to set up a schedule for the accounts payables uh, to do it, I believe, twice a month. And uh, so it'll be scheduled like it is for payroll so that uh, we can better inform the treasurer so we can invest those funds that aren't currently invested at higher rates to generate more income from the county. So that will uh, assist the, the finance department. We'll just need to notify the treasurer a day or two in advance what the total accounts payable sum will be. And then we'll be able to uh, make the, he'll be able to draw the transfer from the investment firm to cover those expenses. The next item uh, that you have, let's see. Oh, you went to the budget. Okay. Uh, in in your board packets, I've provided uh, just the sample of the information from the State Corporation Commission so you can see what that looks like. And one thing about both the real estate and personal property for public utilities is taxed at the real estate rate. So it's not taxed, the, their vehicles are not taxed as personal property. It's all the total assessment is uh, calculated by what your current real estate rate is, is what the state law is. Okay, I guess we're ready now to get down to the, uh, oh, no, this, let me explain this. Uh, I provided you copies. I had Levita run, there's a customized report on the BII system that allows to show you what the transfers have been. This is the last two fiscal years. Okay, in the next tab, I guess it's tab three. Uh, it, it shows you uh, wh where the trans, what the initial budget was, the initial appropriation, the transfers to those budgets. Then it shows you what percent, and this is the end of the fiscal year. So it shows you what says available was the balance that was left over, and then it tells you the percentage of that line item that was used. So if you just, let me see if we can just, if we can turn to the last page, that kind of helps save time and effort. When I was trying to do this, looking through the ledger, it uh, took quite a bit of time. But as you can see is when it says the company total for the general fund, basically uh, in this fiscal year 22, 86% of the appropriation was spent in the far right-hand column. And basically, you had $7.8 million left over in those line items after all the changes and transfers were made. So we're trying to minimize that to get it right more on the front end and uh, make this a much easier process. Then you would have it for the subsequent year. Uh, you had 89% uh, of the appropriation used 
and just over seven million dollars uh, available of the appropriation. That would be the last page in the the second year. This is all the way. If there's two separate fiscal years, if you can see up, it'll say seven one twenty two to six thirty twenty three. So you have two separate fiscal years. And that's just to kind of help you have a better understanding of what's happened in the past uh, as we move forward. I don't know if anybody has any questions or. So just to clarify, make sure I understand correctly. We took in a little over $7 million more than what was needed. And no, that's of the appropriation. Got of the appropriation that was left. Okay. This is when I go to the next starting proposed budget next question. Is that yeah, that's it. Okay. Okay, we switched over to the other larger binder. farther we'll get down further uh, originally uh, in, the, was set up in the bright system which I'm not sure why they previously did that and I don't think we'll be to know why either it's just the way it's been done but uh, putting the initial current real estate taxes up there in lump sum uh, that's not really you want the computer to do the work for you so you'll see where I move that number down to the current tax year when we go to the next page. But uh, what, uh, let's see, okay. If you look under the administrative column, uh, that's basically my numbers. The other numbers were, I guess, the combination of uh, what the former finance director uh, put in and so forth. And then as we update them, but the column that I'm recommending and Lavita and I worked on is under the administrative column. So if we come down to the real estate taxes starting uh, from 20 and 21, you'll see that I've done an estimate of what I think will be collected in those years. And then if you turn to page two, uh, the prior year estimates, and then the 2025 estimate, and you'll see that number is less because I've reduced it based on the uncollectible uh, probabilities. It's great if you go over it, it's easier to go up than it is to go and take money away from somebody. Uh, the real estate for the public service, as you can see, they were still estimating at 2 million when that actual number uh, comes out to be 795,087. Okay, then if we go to page three of it again, I've estimated the prior year delinquent tax collections with the treasurer I'm estimating that he will make. And then the personal property tax is estimated at 11,143,520. And part of what that has included, uh, I spoke with Regina and she gave me some of her information that was presented, I guess, to the board last year and some of her estimates. I went out to the websites of those jurisdictions and I got their audits and I did the best I could of trying to come up with an estimate for uh, what we would thought it would be. And uh, so we've put $350,000 in there for the proration of the personal property taxes. It may very well be higher, but I prefer to be conservative and go with a, a lower number. 
Uh, the mobile home taxes, uh, you know, they're taxed at the real estate rate. And so uh, we have put those numbers in the total 27,000. Uh, the machinery and tools tax, if you go down to the sort of bottom of that section, is 170,000 estimate. I've allowed for uncollectibles. Uh, the penalties and interest, I've done those estimates. And if you look at crossing over on this uh, form, you can see what the actuals were for 21, 22, and 23. Then it has your current adopted budget, what it is in the current year, in the current year actual revenues. So you can kind of monitor what the trends are and, and understand that, okay? Okay, then we've uh, went to the next on page five. Uh, you have the sales and use tax. Uh, that was uh, bumped up because the uh, legislature approved uh, applying the sales tax to, I think, electronic devices and so forth. And so that's the number we've used from the state tax department. Although uh, I've heard that the governor may veto that. So I know he's vetoed 166 bills. I don't know if that was one of them or not, but we've went with the number that the state tax department uh, provided us in the document. Uh, the consumer utility tax, uh, that's estimated at 280,000. Uh, the local consumption tax, which you get to see on your electric bill each month. Uh, then the business license uh, fee estimate that I've used and then the uh, bank franchise taxes. Uh, you all, or the Board of Supervisors eliminated the vehicle license fee last year, so you'll see that that uh, is no longer an estimate in that section. Uh, the interest on business license, uh, it, we're estimating at 1,500. The recordation taxes, now these are the recordation taxes that are collected locally by your clerk of the court. So we're estimating 576,564. Uh, then the uh, local tax from the clerk is 130,000 is our estimate. Uh, the in interest on uh, local fines is estimated at $3,500. So the total local taxes come in an estimate of uh, 7,254,240. Uh, the other uh, local taxes uh, that we include is the transient occupancy tax that we're estimating at 150,000. Uh, the meals tax is estimated at 1.6 million. Uh, the communications tax is at 285,000. Uh, that tax has been declining since it was implemented. And I'll just give you an example. In Westmoreland, we used to collect when it would be paid directly to the treasurer and not passed through the state tax department, we were collecting over three quarters of a million dollars. It has declined by about 75%. So all the promises that were made by the legislature that we would be even and good didn't happen. Uh, the ambulance recovery fee, uh, we received the new updated figures from Chief Moody, which is 1.3 million. The cigarette tax at uh, one million eight fifty. Uh, I'm not sure how uh, the previous director came up with the estimate of two point five million, but if you can see from your prior actual years, it's quite frankly been declining. So I'm not sure. And I did call the uh, folks from the state who, since they tax it, they know pretty well what the number of tax of cigarettes are and they felt we should be a little bit more conservative. Uh, the next uh, grouping is basically fees that are collected through community development, and I'm not gonna read every one of those. I did, uh, Levita uh, drew up for me uh, the five-year history. I was wanted to know whether, whether those fees were covering at least 50% of the personnel cost, and, and they are. So uh, we always tried to shoot for the fees covering at least half of, 
of the operation and that they are covering that. Okay. So if you go to page eight, basically for all those fees, the community development is generating $1.2 million to help cover uh, the expenses. <clears throat> then we move on to the next section, fines and forfeitures. Uh, the uh, estimate by the previous director was 185. I've done some calculations where I would feel comfortable for putting 210 uh, thousand in as that estimate. If you look at the prior years, uh, as, well, I don't assume I know most of it's the sheriff's department because the state police we don't get any of those fees. They all go to the Commonwealth. So, uh, so I feel comfortable with that number. The DI or DUI restitution fees, I believe that's through the Commonwealth attorney. Uh, to get those funds. Uh, the DMV stop fee that the treasury uses, uh, I'm estimating that at 30,000. Uh, of course, that really depends on the number of delinquent uh, vehicles and so forth that they use that stop on. Uh, the dog violation fees, you must have some very well behaved dogs because you don't have very many uh, fines here. Um, then the vehicle registration fines and then the e-summons, which I think is, is it $5? Here, the, 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 yeah, and so that helps go to the I uh, guess electronic ticketing or or whatever that uh, program is. Also, <laughs> under the uh, interest on deposits investments, I'm recommending an estimate of seven hundred thousand. I really think it's going to be more than that, but uh, the treasurer and I have not concluded working with those folks to get those changes. So I prefer to be on the conservative side. Uh, Nobody ever went broke by having uh, more revenue than what they estimated. So uh, then the citizen center rental fee is at 35,000. I believe Chris has proposed some increases in the Chris here yeah, in those fees, uh, which I'll want to discuss with you. And as a matter of fact, I think I forgot to put the copy in your uh, section here. So we'll try to get that before we the part here today. Okay, the wireless tower uh, leases uh, is roughly 56,000. Uh, although last year in 23, you uh, generated more. I'm trying to get my hands to look at those agreements. I know Mr. Stewart, uh, are you having, okay. Uh, Mr. Stewart says that he's having a meeting tomorrow with uh, some of the, the owners, I guess, of those and he asking that I join in that conversation. So I'm not sure. I did speak with Assistant Chief Basham, and I think they indicated that they wish to, uh, I guess, renew a contract. I'm not quite clear why. Uh, I didn't see in the contract where it was required to do that. So I'm not sure what their rationale is other than perhaps extending the contract or something. So I guess we'll learn more about that tomorrow. Uh, then we go on uh, the local DNA fees, uh, local court, court appointed uh, attorney fees, uh, the courthouse maintenance fees uh, at 31,000. Hopefully you get a bigger courthouse now, you'll be able to generate more money by bringing those folks in. Uh, the courthouse security personnel fee, uh, which I believe goes in support of the uh, bailiffs and so forth, uh, the home detention, the local witness fee and uh, the jail admission fee. So that totals 142,600 for those sections. Uh, then we have some miscellaneous uh, revenue that's collected from everything from animal control to the CSA program. Uh, some other contributions, I guess, uh, from other uh, departments or so forth. And these are generally smaller uh, sums of money, which so the miscellaneous comes to about 177,500. Uh, then uh, some of the uh, utilities and so forth uh, and reimbursements uh, that are handled, I guess, is that from the power companies and so forth. Uh, so um, that shows up as 45,000. 
<clears throat> the circuit court or secretary reimbursement uh, that comes from the other jurisdictions where your circuit judge sits and I used to sign a check every year to King George to pay the Westmoreland County share of that. Um, and whichever counties I think the judge covers, we pay a prorated share of his support staff. Um, the rolling stock tax of uh, 4,000, the mobile home titling tax is uh, 80,000. <clears> and as I said earlier, the state recordation tax fee and so forth was eliminated. So uh, I have not included that total in there. Uh, the Personal Property Relief Act funds is 2.1 million. Uh, that's been frozen, I think, since either 2007 or 2009. Uh, the auto rental tax is uh, 45,000. Uh, I know that during COVID, we took quite a hit on that for people minimizing their travel and so forth. <laughs> so the non-categorical aid estimate is 2.2 million. And then you have the shared expenses from uh, the compensation board, which we uh, retrieved from their website and put in there. I won't go through and list each one individually, uh, but the total uh, from the state compensation board and the electoral board, state electoral board, is roughly $2.5 million contributed in revenue towards the various operations of the constitutional officers. Uh, the victim uh, witness grant, uh, I assume part of this is because I think there's two places I thought one is federal and one is state. This is state, okay. And then the uh, VCGA grant. Uh, so these are not really large grants. The fire program funds of 155,000. And I'm not sure where the four for life funds, apparently since they've lost all their money. Nobody knows whether or not we'll ever be getting any money again in the next four to five years. Um, so um, let's see, then we're down to the small sum of litter control on page 14. Uh, so on page 15, you see the reimbursement for welfare administration, uh, and then the other reimbursements for the various programs that are billed at different levels. Uh, some are 90, 10, 80, 20, and so uh, some are entirely funded by the federal government and state, others have require a county match and so forth. Um, then uh, we have some of the criminal justice grants uh, in the budget. Uh, then the wireless board grant uh, of 99,718. So the other categorical aid from the Commonwealth or the federal government is 4.3 million. Um, then uh, I believe this is the, under the categorical aid miscellaneous, the technology trust fund is what the circuit court uh, receives for, I guess, help maintaining their records and I believe digitizing the records and so forth. Uh, then uh, again, the federal, Victim Witness Assistant Grant of 44,100. And then the LEPEG Grant, uh, I believe that's for emergency services, is it not? Yeah. Okay. All right, then uh, going over to page 17, uh, down to the DUI uh, grant for the Sheriff's Department, I believe for enforcement, some other miscellaneous grants. Uh, is, is, um, as you can see, and then back to welfare administration, where the state's contribution towards that operation, and then other programs that they have. Uh, coming back to uh, on page 18 of $1.5 million. Uh, the non-revenue receipts estimate is uh, $50,000 from uh, insurance reimbursements. And I've basically relied on, relied on the finance staff to provide me that number. And they have a better idea of, uh, of what those may be. Uh, then uh, the sale of uh, county vehicles and so forth. And then we come over 
uh, to uh, page 19. And this is a change in the way it's been done in the past. I'm transferring the money from the capital improvement fund to the general fund because I'm bringing all the debt services applicable to the general fund into the general fund because the auditors, that's how they report it. So it's kind of senseless for it to transfer money to the capital improvement fund, then to the debt service fund, and it's just a lot of extra steps. So it's reported in the general fund. It's like for grants for or, or loans for the schools and other uh, general fund activities. So, uh, so we're simply going to transfer that money from the capital improvement fund directly to the general fund to uh, uh, cover that cost. And then uh, the balance forward from the um, uh, water and sewer authority of one point eight million dollars. No, on the this is how it's set up. Oh, that's, that's our fund balance under the budget. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. That's the uh, the transfer from the fund balance. Well, small, we put it at the beginning, not the end. So, okay, that's the $1.8 million is use of the fund balance to uh, bring us back to have the revenues sufficient to cover the expenditures. And now we're switching over to uh, the expenditure side of the program. Okay. Uh, as you can see, the uh, Board, or the Board of Supervisors budgets uh, and adjustments for the insurance and health insurance premiums for those who take it and so forth. Uh, you have put those funds together. The County Administrator's budget uh, has uh, been approved. We've eliminated uh, part-time funds. Uh, I don't anticipate that will be necessary in the upcoming fiscal year. Uh, then in the county attorney's budget, you'll see a significant reduction in expense to 253,115. I spoke with uh, Mr. Stewart to cover the legal fees and, and discussions. And so uh, part of that is his uh, contract with the county then uh, some additional funds or perhaps outside legal counsel that may be needed in regard to some issues. Uh, the human resources budget, uh, I've reduced that. I've eliminated the director's position. And so you'll have in there uh, one full-time employee and two part-time employees, which I believe will be sufficient to uh, handle the tasks that are needed to be done. Uh, the Commissioner of Revenue's budget is uh, pretty much uh, steady. Uh, all these budgets have included either a 3% raise other than for uh, the Fire and Rescue and Sheriff's Department, which we utilized the previous scale that I guess was negotiated or, or decided on previously. So that's how uh, we have calculated those figures. Uh, we... Uh, we got more information regarding the reassessment that needs to be done. And unfortunately, those figures were lower. So we got a, a much better estimate on what we think the actual cost will that will be. And so that's something that the board will need to think on promptly here of getting an RFP out to interview prospective uh, assessors to perform that task. Uh, the treasurer's budget is pretty much a standard other than the 3% increase. Uh, the Department of Finance, uh, we have uh, done some realignment there. Uh, we're going to do some cross training, and you'll see that that uh, uh, budget has been uh, reduced. And I'll let Lavita, do you want to kind of explain what we've done in your department to get to that number roughly? Okay. Yeah. Well, why don't you go ahead and explain because you know all your different folks and what we got to do. Yeah. Okay. So what we've done in finances kind of cross-utilize our current staff. 
Um, we're just going to move some people around. So, uh, Ms. Uh, Dillard, she has a background in finance and in accounting and audit. So my plan is with board approval is to move her to the accounting manager position. And that way I can cross utilize her, um, not only in procurement, but um, on the audit side and also budget. Um, Ms. Kimberly Cook, she earned her VCA not too long ago. So she's a Virginia contract and associate, she's certified. So my hope is to bump her up to procurement manager. Um, then also, we had something else in the works um, because school AP will now, effective July 1, you guys approved that, where the duties have gone over to the school, but the position stays with us. But um, what we're going to do to re kind of relieve some of that but um, and, and lower the cost on our end is to split that um, with another department. So finance will kind of split, split a position with another department and we'll pay 15% of that cost for that person. So that right there reduces our cost drastically by doing that and then cross training a lot of our members um, or employees um, in our department so that everyone has backup. So that's the plan. Norm and I talked through it. And you have a retiree too, person in time. We do, I'm sorry. Payroll. We have a, a payroll specialist that is retiring, but I do have a staff member that has a background in payroll who currently does AP. So we're training her now in payroll to move her there. And so we're trying to backfill and plan ahead so we don't have any gaps. I'm sure I know the answer to this, but just to make sure all the people that are affected by these changes, they've been briefed, they're okay with them? That was what I was just saying. Okay. <laughs> I, they have, I've talked to some of them one-on-one, -on -one, so they know what my plan is, but we have not put, well, it's out there now. But I, I've talked with one of them who's concerned, obviously, about their job. And, uh, you're going to be transferred to do other things, but nobody's losing their job. No. No, just making sure you don't have a line of people outside your office tomorrow yelling at you and uh, make sure we know how many emails we're going to get overnight. <laughs> Ma'am, I'd like to commend you on that. That's good personnel management. Um, wow, wow. Mr. Stroud. Could you pull his over because it, you can't hear it online? So if it's messing up, could you use his so that it can be online, please? You want to repeat what you said? Well, there'll be a there'll be a space of stuff that only the people in this room have heard. That's why I was asking if you wanted to do. Basically, Ms. Cobb, he was saying um, thank you, and that that was a good job of of just being a leader in your office and just translating and moving people at the position we see them fit. I knew that that's something you've been talking about before, and that there are people you felt that were right below you that were qualified to do more. So he just said that's that's good team management. That's that's pretty much it. Right. Thank you. Um, I have not done that yet because I just wanted to make sure Norm and I and then the entire board were on the same page before we made these moves. So we just wanted to put the conversation out there. And if you guys are amenable to that, then I'll work with Mr. Rosavi and Ms. Bender and get things rolling. And I apologize. I don't know her name. But the one lady that comes in with you that presents the fire station, what, what's her name? That's Laverne Miller. That's what you're that's, speaking about. Okay. That, that's what I was making sure of. I thought that was her. I, was like, I think she does a good job. I've had quite a few conversations with her, and she's a pleasure. Ms. Bender? I just want to commend Ms. Cobb and her staff because I really appreciate the forward looking and the different approach. And it's 
She's done a lot of work, especially with the budget and refining with Norm, the processes and her staff has been great. So I just want to shout out to the community, Ms. Cobb and her staff, kudos to you. All right. Okay. And then we go on to the next uh, information technology. Apparently we didn't cut that enough. <laughs> No, uh, we've uh, pretty much uh, come pretty close to, I guess, what the request was for that department. And uh, they keep everybody moving forward with the uh, technology that uh, needs to be handled. Uh, the electoral board, uh, that budget's pretty stable. Uh, the registrar, I did recommend as part of this budget uh, increasing her, she spoke to me about increasing the part-time position to the full-time position. So we increased that uh, so that, uh, you know, with the presidential election upcoming and so forth. And I believe she probably would like to retire sometime soon, like some of us have an interest in. And uh, so, <laughs> so uh, anyway, so that's what the, significant changes yeah okay so the last of that is on page nine for that budget covering it and uh so but that's why you would have that change there for the taking a part-time and making it a full-time position uh the circuit court I guess it includes the judge's secretary salary, uh, the jurors, and other expenses for the operation of uh, that office. Can I interrupt for a second? Mm -hmm. I apologize. You may have did this while I was in the restroom, but uh, Ms. Gump had asked for um, adding another person to her staff. Was that reflected in the, uh, the registrar? No. Okay. I, I took the part, I thought my understanding was we were going to take the part time position. And make it a full time position. Okay. Now, uh, okay. Got it. Is that what? Yes. Yeah, my understanding is correct. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, then the combined. Okay. The combined courts, uh, I guess, juvenile and general district court, uh, not a significant increase in their budget. And then the funds for the magistrate that you provide. Uh, then moving on to the circuit uh, clerk's budget, just including the 3% raise, uh, maintenance contracts, and other things that have insurance costs that have went up. Then the trust fund for the technology uh, that's required. Then the law library. Uh, or no, I'm sorry, that's the wrong title. To the victim witness on page 12 that uh, covers uh, the task. Does it, I assume that person works out of the Commonwealth Attorney's Office. Is that right? Okay. Sometimes it's different, so I wasn't sure how that worked. Uh, the Commonwealth Attorney's budget, uh, which includes the three percent. I have spoke with her regarding some of her professional staff and so forth. And I know Mr. Stroud and I have had a discussion about the so-called salary study. Uh, and so I've, I've got the data, got human resources to get the data myself. And so I, I think we just need to do our own assessment because uh, quite frankly, most of that information was not helpful in, in determining that. Absolutely, sir. And I don't think that the general public knows, based on the last board that a brief had last year, how jacked up the study was. So, uh, just for the people that are listening in, uh, that study did not use the counties local here. They used northern counties by direction. So, somebody on the last board instructed them not to use local counties, which artificially inflated it. 
but in reviewing some of that, I believe it will merit additional review. And I spoke the sheriff and I spoke about this several weeks ago, and uh, also with Chief Moody and some other departments. And but unfortunately, there's only so much you can do in 29 hours a week. So that's something that we will have to deal with, or your hopefully your future county administrator will have to deal with. One other thing on that is that whenever those are done, that the the managers have to review them and make sure because the way that they're done, whenever an employee does it on his own and it doesn't, they're not compared to what they actually do and know it's what they were hired to do. So somebody was hired on, they get an offer letter for the position that they're working in. And then the salary study should align to that. And if they don't align, the manager looks at it and says, wait a second, you don't really do these things. Or says, wait a second, you're doing these things, but you weren't hired to do them. Or maybe they're doing a lot more, as is going to be the case in Ms. Levitas, and now you need to look at a salary adjustment. Because somebody's doing more, then those things need to be addressed. But they evidently didn't necessarily happen the last time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, then you see the Commonwealth Attorney's recommended budget, uh, then uh, public safety in the Sheriff's Department. Basically, uh, his request, uh, what I'm recommending is two additional bailiffs. Uh, he did request some other items, but right at the present time, I was struggling to try to get under $2 million of the fund balance. And I, I would like to sit down. I haven't had a chance to reach out to him, but I've got some other suggestions that we may be able to deal with the dispatch situation. But uh, his includes uh, his salary scale that uh, was adopted whenever several years ago, and that was all calculated under that. Correct. Okay. Uh, okay. And then uh, let's see. And the sheriff did, uh, and, and we eliminated, I think, his request was for two road deputies, my recollection. So it removed uh, 90,000. I think those were for new vehicles. Is that correct, Sheriff? Uh, and so, uh, and we have moved uh, his replacement vehicles over to uh, the uh, revenue recovery funds. And so one thing about that, they will help if you all approve that once the budget's approved for him to accelerate in getting those uh, vehicles faster. Okay, then is DUI enforcement, speed enforcement grant, uh, and some other small uh, expenditures. Uh, the school uh, security, I assume this is for the school resource officers. And are there school resource? Yeah. That's not, I missed. It used to be so. Right now, we'll just oh. oh, okay. I read the wrong label there. Okay, so this is his E911 budget next, halfway down the page on 15. And uh, so we applied that uh, information to, to that. And so, um, you know, we've tried to meet what parts of his request that we could. Sizable jump in the health insurance premium, but that's critical to maintaining your workforce. And so um, the 1.419 million total is what we're recommending. Then we get down to the Department of Emergency Services and uh, that total comes to 4,857,113 under the salary scale that uh, we've applied to the uh, personnel. Uh, and the overtime, uh, which uh, I'm looking at the current year overtime, and I'm assuming from the chief that's due to the vacancies and having mandatory overtime. So um, then uh, he did, uh, Levita, I asked Levita to work with him to reduce a few of the line items, which I think was, was done. And I honestly don't recall specifically what those were, but. Okay. okay. But anyway, so we're looking at a, a, a recommended budget of 8.8 .8 million. 
uh, for his department. Then the fire and rescue services. Uh, is that right? I'm trying to see some of these titles here. Okay, is that fire and rescue then next? Okay. Then talking about some of his contracted service, uh, lease of the building and other things come to 674,704. Then uh, under the ambulance uh, recovery, the fee to the contractor for the billing is estimated at 92,368. Then on page 19, you have uh, some miscellaneous grants in the amount of 216,139 on page 19. Then starting on page uh, 22, uh, you have the uh, juvenile detention center and uh, the regional jail uh, budget. And I believe those estimates are provided by the jail administrator and the uh, 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 juvenile detention, I guess, director. Uh, then the uh, VCHIN's uh, program uh, showing the salaries there, uh, which totaled 86823 so that comes to a total for that grouping of 1.6 million. Then we come on page 23, the sheriff's animal control budget. Uh, and uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, and I believe the sheriff worked with Levita to trim a little bit on that budget. So every little bit helps trying to get to where we need to be. Then the landfill budget, uh, basically, I believe Mike looked this over. And uh, so it comes to 584,785. The convenience center uh, sites come to 472,000. So you're talking about public works landfill, a little over a million dollars on page 25. Then your public works uh, construction the engineer, I assume this is uh, Mr. Quisenberry and uh, Rice. Uh, and that total budget comes to uh, $400,098. And then the whopping number of 4,350 that you get for the state for litter control. Uh, doesn't really cover a lot. Then general properties uh, on page 27. Uh, we went through and looked at some of those. I know uh, Mike uh, was cooperative with uh, us in working on trying to scrim some of those. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Drew. Not trying to belabor things, but on that the litter control. Yes. Do we know what that? is on that line 6013 education recreation supplies for the litter control the 48 is i assume that they use it for information on you can use it for a number of things that the state gives you like putting up litter signs educational programs i mean there's certain restrictions on what it has to be used for i don't have those right handy with me but we can get those for you Thanks, sir. Okay, then general properties. Uh, my total recommended is two million one forty two five twenty eight. Uh, the citizen center uh, recommendation is a total of uh, thirty six thousand three thirty one, and so the total for public works then is two point five million. Okay, starting on page 29, uh, the, this is the contractual amount with the Department of Health, which they send those agreements to the localities every year. And so that's the matching funds that uh, 
we are required to uh, budget to, to meet that. Then again, the, you have the social services budget with the various matches and uh, we had a very good meeting with the director and uh, the CSA, I guess director or whatever her title is. Uh, one of the things that we cut a considerable amount uh, from the budget was from the CSA program. They were, uh, my work, was it about 800,000? Uh, you know, that program is so uncertain, and as you probably know over the years, it fluctuates up and down. And so everybody prefers to try to get the full amount when you get out of the gate. And I looked at historically, let's turn to the page so we can see. Where? 31? Yeah, okay. Uh, let's see, where? Okay, yeah, down at the bottom. Uh, as you can see, the request was 4.8. And so he met with uh, Levita and I, and we discussed it. And uh, I asked him if he would recalculate that on what he had now. And I said, look, if, if you go over and these kids qualify, then you just have to come back to the board and get a supplemental appropriation. And it fluctuates, but you know, it seemed kind of senseless to me to tie up that amount of money right out of the gate. So he was very cooperative, he and his staff, to assist us with trying to get these numbers down to a more reasonable amount. On page 31, at, towards the bottom. And that's a program I can tell you in Westmoreland, we, we dealt with the same things. And the program initially started probably, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago. You were spending three and 400,000. Now you're spending millions. And we have complained to our legislators that it's sort of become a, a lucrative operation for certain private sector that are trying to meet this because they see all this money being available. And I used to sit on the, that committee and uh, I would sometimes question some of the individuals who are providing the service. And I would say, is uh, student X progressing? And a lot of times, well, it's just maintenance. And so when you're paying 150 some thousand dollars a year, you don't want to hear things are just being maintained. If there's not an improvement, then it seems to me you need to do a more cost effective option. And so, but, uh, but that has become a cottage industry, and a lot of the people at the state level admit that. And it's just uh, not to say that some of the people don't provide an excellent service, but, but there are some that have used the rules to their advantage. Okay, on page uh, 32, we come to the rec department, and uh, we. Uh, met with uh, Chris and he uh, did provide us some uh, reduction to knock down some of the costs. And so our recommend budget is $971,070. The community development budget, uh, Again, the director worked with us to reduce some of his uh, line items. And so the recommended budget is 1.6 million for the community development operation. Then the planning and zoning board, uh, our recommendation for that is 44,730. And the Department of Economic Development, uh, we did eliminate the second position in that office. Uh, and so, but there are funds that uh, when uh, your new county administrator shows up, you can all discuss how you wish to proceed with that. And that total budget is $257,305. Uh, Uh, the VPI extension service, uh, we're recommending 156724 I've requested a copy of the contract that the locality has to sign with uh, Virginia Tech, and I don't think we've received that as of yet. 
So uh, I understand there's been some changes and so forth in that office. So uh, we just had to do it based on what uh, information we had at the time. So, but uh, that's possible to be adjusted once we see what the actual contract says. Uh, what then, is VPI? Virginia Tech. And then uh, the county in and out of here, I'll let Lavita explain that, Mr. Wayne. Okay. Okay, so the county in and out, the 43500 that is the money that we use, that we get back from the schools for the school security. So we, for security, so um, the sheriff's office, basically. So whenever um, the sheriff's office, when they uh, have a deputy do like the school outings, or not, not the resource officers, can we charge it to 9140? Mm -hmm. Right, sporting events and everything like that. So we get reimbursed for that. And so we use this fund or this expenditure line for that. So we charge it to that, and then we'll send a bill to the school, and then they give us that money back. So that's what the 43.5 is in the budget for. You're welcome. One question, I'm not sure, perhaps either the school board chairman or sheriff can answer it. Did, have you all exhausted all the grants for the school resource officers? Yes. Okay, so that period's been done, so you can no longer apply? Okay. So the answer was yes and yes. Yes. For the public. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. This uh, then the risk management. We're doing something a little bit different. Uh, previously, all these insurances were divided up over the offices, which created a lot of extra work for the finance department. And so we're just assembling all these under one account which makes far fewer transactions for workers' comp and all the other items, uh, vehicles and so forth. It just simplifies the whole process. One thing that we are looking at is uh, we're getting a quote from Versa, which is uh, the old municipal uh, LIG quote, and we're going to compare those to see if there's any potential savings as long as the coverages are comparable. Yes, sir. So I saw... They should have been removed, like workers' comp and all that. You should have seen under our column where they were taken out. Right. And so moved. In the department of yeah. The only time I left them in would, would have been for social services, because if I don't, then excuse their reimbursement. Yeah. You do a cost allocation plan for social services at the end of the year. So any support that the county does, they reimburse the county some percentage and nobody can really, it's like the composite index in schools. Nobody, everybody talks about it, but nobody can explain it. And then, so is there a limitation on who we use for that? These are two, uh, VACORP is through the Virginia Association of Counties and VERSA is through the DML. So they're quasi-governmental entities that's authorized by the state government. And generally they're far cheaper than if you went out and got it quoted by a local agent. And then uh, the contribution to the agencies, uh, the only one I removed was the uh, Red Cross. I'm not familiar enough with these others. So uh, I spoke with the chairman and the vice chairman and basically that's something that I'm gonna leave up to you all because I'm just simply not familiar with some of the, I mean, obviously the community college and ones that all the counties contribute to, I'm familiar with, but a lot of these I simply am not familiar with. So I will let your judgment prevail on what you wish to do with this. Could we go through some of those now while we're here? Yep. Is there any, any uh, on that list that the board doesn't want to see funded anymore? 
other book only at the end, not in that book. Just in the other book. So I would like to um, get rid of the FRA, American Regional Alliance. Does anybody else have interest in that? I would second that. Linda, what's your feeling? I had asked Mr. Rasabi just to to do a little research on that. So I don't know if he's, he's had time. He's been really busy. Uh, I have not got the answer from Mr. Stewart. I'm not sure if it's a required uh, to us to fund that, but I, I have sent him that question. So I have not received the answer yet. I don't know. Mr. Sullins, Mr. Stroud, what's your interest on the FRA? No, well, sir. Uh, yeah, that's one thing we may want to think about. We, the FRA does a lot for the county, provides a lot of benefits. So um, at least having that, that reach back, the ability to work with them on economic development. For the county, so I just want to throw that out there. They do they do do a lot, uh, a lot of help to the county. <laughs> Mr. Sullivan, you taking the vote now? I'm trying to get the consensus. Ooh, yes or no? We have two yeses, one maybe, and I think you're a no, and you are a yes. Yes. So we can remove that. Mr. Zavi. Okay, well, let me check. Uh, Levita seems to think it's mandated. Uh, I don't know the answer to that right off the top of my head, but uh, I can speak with uh, Mr. Stewart and we can look at the statute and see. I just don't know off the top of my head. All right, if it is um, able to be removed, um, the consensus is we'd like to remove it. Mr. Collins, just. On that point, I know we've discussed this many times at GWRC and some of the other localities do put less in than the required effort. So there's also, even if it's mandated, you can increase it or or make it lower than what they request. So I just want to put it out there. And then the last thing is, I know this is, old, it was on the other slide, but one of them is, is listed as the one I serve on Healthy Generations, listed as Repahannock Area Agency on Aging, but it's also known as Healthy Generations. And that is, our senior resource, and that is required effort, but it gets confused a lot. I'd like to remove uh, MICA um, uh, Ministries, and that, um, and keep on the um, Thurman Briston. Thurman Briston is a a hand up, if not a handout, like um, MICA is. So that's my feeling on that one. Mr. Sellers. So is Mike a, a homeless shelter? It is. It's, um, it's, there's federal funds to go to that. And um, the uh, other one, they don't get any federal funds. They rely on local contributions and contributions of um, people. So they don't have to go by the same rules. They, they require Southern Bristol requires people um, to get a job, to give them Bristol. Yeah, yeah. And they, so, I'm sorry. So they, all, they also um, require them to get drug treatment if they need it. I mean, it's, there's families, there's singles. Like I said, the easiest way to say that is a hand up, not a hand out. So they have like a, I think it was a 90% success rate of not returning. But the other one is just a, a revolving door. So that's my feeling on that. So just to make sure we're on the same, I'm, I'm kind of play, playing devil's advocate here and, you know, not necessarily made up my mind one way or the other, but I, I kind of characterize uh, the two different types of shelters. One is a, a launch pad to try to help people get back on their feet. That would be the Brisbane Center. Other types are safety nets for those that th they're never going to go anywhere. Um, is that what MICA is? I, I know you're characterizing them as a hand up versus a handout. I know Brisbane can't accept certain people because of uh, drug usage, 
uh, mental illness and so on. If if we take away from Micah, are we leaving those people out in the cold? So Micah it doesn't have a real service to King George. Um, when when um, the other shelter came in, they serviced King George at a much higher rate. So um, if we're going to fund Fredericksburg's uh, folks, I'm not a fan of that. I want to fund help King George. That, that really happens. Mr. Chair, just to clarify a little bit more, because we talk about a lot of this at GWRC, George Washington Regional Commission for the acronym out there, is there are two different funding model, models with MICA and, and uh, Thurman Brisbane. And I don't always agree with the MICA model, but they both, there are two different options that people use. MICA it does the HUD model, which means a home first. So anyone that comes, no matter what their disability, whatever it is, they, they try to find them shelter and assistance. Where Thurman Brisbane, they offer, but they, they have um, where they, they kind of screen them first to make sure families aren't exposed to people that maybe are high on drugs or are criminals or pedophiles. So there's two different models. And some support one, some support the other, or they support both. And unfortunately, the Thurman Brisbane, um, we're one of the few localities that truly support them because they cannot get a lot of federal funding because they don't do the housing first model where MICA does get federal funding. So I see the value in both of them. They're two different models. Mm -hmm. I would support giving a little bit more to Thurman Brisbane because they do spend a, a lot of their their money they have is from localities and we they do service King George residents, but MICA has a, has has a role too, but they do qualify for more federal funding because they follow the federal HUD policy of housing people first. So what's the will of the board? You want to fund both? You want to fund one? What? You want to fund one part of it? One full? One not full? Whatever. What was the will of the board? Somebody come for it. Well, what did we give last year to Micah, or did we? None. We gave none. And none. they came this year asking for it? Yes. Yes. They come every year. Any other no's to Micah? I'll say no. I'll say no. Okay. I see some value, but it's the will of the board. Okay. Then how about um, Thurman Brisbane? Everybody good with that? We're not good with that. Okay. I'm good. Yeah, I'm good with Brisbane. Okay. All right. Thurman Brisbane. I didn't see um, the King George food, um, what's it called? Um, Love thy neighbor. Does it have a number on it? I don't see it. How much is it? 34500 for love thy neighbor. <laughs> I, I think that even though it's a, it services King George residents highly, and I, I, I thoroughly um, support them, but I, I would like to at least drop it by. So 34000 is a big ask for the first year. So I'd like to drop that a bit. If anybody else has an interest, let me know. If you don't, let me know. I would say keep it where it is. Okay. Stroud? Yes, sir. I'm gonna I'm gonna agree with Mr. Davis based on the brief that we received and that they have no no paid help. But their demand continues to to go up. So, and that they and that they service King George. So, yes, I agree. Okay. I agree. All righty. And we'll keep it the same. And Mr. Any, Collins, I anybody any other ones on that? List? I just and excuse me, I don't recognize what's the rapid Hannock Refuge. The Lois Ann House. And that was a part of the package. What one is that? Because I don't remember that one. Is that a first request or? Yeah, are you familiar with that one? I know you 
use several different. The very bottom one, Sheriff Job. One. Rappahannock Refuge. I've never seen that one before, so I, I I do have a question on that one because if that's just because lots of lots of people put in the portal that Stafford County runs to for these outside agencies, so you know. So you all want to put that on hold until we find out what it is. Okay. So yes, that is a first time request. Okay. Can we research that a little bit more? So what is that exactly is? What's the will of the board? The bottom one. Oh, Mr. Dines, I think, pulled it up. It's the Fredericksburg Addiction Center. It's on Lafayette Boulevard. The Addiction Center. Yeah. I don't know how many. I would like to find out how many King George residents it serves, because I've never seen that one before. So in that vein, the Addiction Center, we've entered into an agreement um, with the opioid money for addiction in the three or four county area. Am I correct, Sheriff? So if you all wanted to pull that out, I don't think that would be a, um, I think we're giving all our money to that for, you know, the entire region. So it's up to y'all. You want to keep it in, keep it out, research it. I agree with um, Ms. Bender on the fact that uh, it, I like to find out if it's a King George citizens are being serviced there. If we don't, we're not dealing with that here in King George. So if they're being serviced there, then it, it might be worth keeping to us to find out. Okay. John? I can close with Mr. Bender. Um, I don't like being in the habit of handing out our constituents' money for, for causes. Um, I'm sure they contribute and get their tax deductions on their own without me doing a part of it. Hey, um, Mr. Sullivan. Sorry, I'm just reading reading up on it real quick online. It actually seems to help homeless children and families more than anything. So let's um, put it on hold, get some more information, and then uh, we can make an educated decision. Mr. Chair, what I'm going to do is I actually have that information from when we shared it to you with you guys at the beginning of the budget cycle. So I'll go ahead and shoot that to you all in the email so you have that. Um, can you not shoot it to an email while we're in a meeting, please? Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yes, sir. Absolutely. <laughs> all righty. Mr. Mazzavi, is there any other one on that um, contribution to agency that anybody wants to address? All, all the ones that you see if you look to the left and see no adopted budget or any previous expenditure, those are all new requests. So you have quite a few new requests. Right, well, we're not funding the, you know, the Fredericksburg Regional Transportation until you come here and some of the other ones. Right. Like the, uh, let's see. Why is the, why is the Fredericksburg regional food like double? So I think that the, the food, this is my opinion, Mr. Stroud, and maybe you can answer, but the, the food bank in Fredericksburg gives food to love thy neighbor. They're like the biggest, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, Contributor, I think that's why that was there. They, but they give a lot of produce, especially to of well, that neighbor. I think that's why that we were had talked about. But whatever the number you all want to come up with, it's fine. You want to keep it as it is. You want to hold it. Um, we don't want to. We want to get this budget moving forward, and we don't want anything held up. So yes, we we talked about that when they did the presentation, Mr. Chair, when Love Thy Neighbor came in, because I asked that exact question: is why would we give the money to them when we just give money to you? And he's like, well, that'd be a bad idea because they do contribute so much to our our food shelter here, and they fill a lot of gaps when needed. So they're a partner. That's the way I look at it. I have no issue with the money. So keep that one in. That's Ms. Bender, Mr. Stroud. 
Mr. Sullins, keep it. Mr. Stroud. I'm I'm not far keeping it, sir. That's a new that's a new request, correct? Okay. Okay. Well, that, so there's three. Want to keep it? So we'll keep it in there. Yeah. Mr. Staff, do you had a question? Uh, just one. So um, no surprise, but the soil and water, um, mm -hmm. very very. Um, they usually keep the same amount, um, but we are experiencing a lot of um, new expenses at the soil and water. Um, we are experiencing a lot of new challenges that we have not faced in, uh, in past years. So um, it's at 55 right now. I would appreciate it if we could move it up to 60. Um, so I've been trying to get our educational director to come before the board and explain a lot of the new programs we're doing. Um, so I, that is the one I'm gonna have paid for. And just make sure that, that um, you state that you are in the soil and water board. For full disclosure, I am a director, um, elected director of the soil and water of County City. What's the will of the board? I'm, I'm not for increasing it, especially since we have. Mr. Sullivan? I say leave it at the same. Stroud, leave it. Keep it the same. Davis? I concur. Okay. All righty, we'll keep it the same. Nice try, Mr. Stroud. <laughs> yeah, you got to try. All righty, I think we're ready to move forward. Yes. Okay, page 39. Uh, the transfer to the school fund. I know I spoke with the superintendent this morning at 7.15, and uh, I know that the school board took some action, but unfortunately, it's been very difficult to cut the budget from $4.3 million down to $1.7, so I think the total, was it $1.7, Levita? There was an error or something, and we went around in a circle, but it, uh, I, I have agreed to meet with him and discuss some other uh, items. He explained some of the you know, requirements from the State Department of Education, but at this late hour, I said, I, I can't change this now. I would throw everything out we just done to try to get. Mr. Bush, could you give the mic and say who you are and then say what you would like to say, sir? I'm chairman of the school board, Mr. David Bush. I'm sorry, I didn't bring any documents with me, but um, what figure do you have right now? The recommended figure I have was from the original request when we made the correction, 24,394,947. That was the original one when Dr. Boyd brought over to me right. when you voted the previous time. And so then I think uh, Levita, and I can't recall your person's name, it's Sherry. Sherry. Uh, there was a mistake of putting, I guess, think something in twice or, or something. That's right. And so, so that was fixed. And I knew you would like us to make because, that up. Yes. So unless you can convince these five folks to supply some more fund balance to make that difference up, uh, it would be very difficult. But I did speak with Dr. Board. He called me at 7:15 this morning as I was driving here, and we discussed it. And I'm certainly willing to sit down and discuss some other options because when I've looked back historically, the school board has had some leftover funds. And so I think that's, some, and other jurisdictions I work, we didn't have a problem reappropriating those if in fact that you have those. So uh, he wants to come and I guess explain to me. Yeah, I would. I, I am sorry. I did not come prepared. I no, wish I, I had I understand. a lot of the documents. Right. But um, yes, there was a mistake and it was corrected. Um, and in order for, if we were to request significantly less, it basically was um, up, we're asking an, an extra 1.7 million. Yes, that's correct. Which would mean a total of about 1.8 something um extra and um, compared to last year of course that's just half of what we were asking for last year compared to the other 
you know, considering we have 75% of the uh, um, of the employees of the whole county and what the other parts of the county, I know this is information you already know, um, is um, I believe it's about 4 million something for the other yeah. part of the county and we're 75% asking for 1.8 and I think right. it's, it's understandable and it's half of what we asked for last year. Right. If we, the, the problem, I'll just this is kind of an overview a little bit. One of the big things we did last year is our salaries were not comparable to a lot of divisions that were our size, and we were bleeding uh, teachers. Um, but, um, we, but we focused on those new teachers. We got them up to a minimum level salary. It helped a lot. Of course, you can imagine we did that, and but we have not uh, addressed the teachers that were here that are five to 15 year teachers. And a lot of them were like, you know, they're about ready to leave again because of the competition we have with counties near our size. We're, we're all in the same boat, the sheriff. Right, I understand. The chief, I understand. I, I've heard this story <laughs> and, and uh, for many well, years yeah. and I understand and that's something that will need to be reviewed but the problem is coming at the late hour, it's very difficult to, you know, I if I put 1.7 million, I would have to tell these folks we would need it over 3 million dollars of the fund balance and uh, I know that we have a meeting scheduled to discuss the fix for the uh, preschool preschool and some of those things and I'm gonna add this discussion to that is that what you're suggesting sir what's it uh, no, I'm not suggesting anything yet until I talk to Dr. <laughs> Boyd okay and, and once he I mean I understood some of the things he explained to me because I've dealt with that in the past but uh, you know we, we've got to get this budget approved as i explained to the chairman advertised and out in a timely fashion to get the tax tickets out i understand because i think the last two years it's been problematic and that's caused a serious problem in the audit and also with the revenues being delayed of coming to the county and so uh i i don't doubt what you're saying i understand it but i believe that uh you know, that's something that's going to be have to dealt with with the same problem that the sheriff, EMS, and other departments have. We're in constant competition against the next guy who can pay more. I understand, I understand, but understanding also that what we're asking for in comparison to the number of employees we have and the number the rest of the county has for is right. significantly less. And um, that we will be able to keep those prime teachers, which we need the most of all. We need to get them in the door. But if they don't, if those five to 15 year teachers don't stay, mm -hmm. are right now we are doing very well, but we're about to lose some more teachers because their issues have not been addressed primarily from what happened with COVID. We basically drew a line at COVID. And so those people that are on that step, they have lost a significant amount of, of salary. And um, so again, we're not keeping up at all. If we could make this change this year, to that steps we do, I know steps don't mean something, but in the steps six through 10, basically, that would correct it from now on. And we would not have this problem again in terms of that. In terms of salary, then we're dealing with the entire staff rather than having to make these corrections due to COVID. I may sound rather confusing and I apologize for that. I mean, I, so, I understand, so Mr. but- um, Mr. Rizzoli, so when I was on the school board about five years ago, we addressed the compression issue then, so it would it would never happen again. And that was before COVID. But now I understand what you're saying, but sometimes what I'm saying is when and I've been on the school board, so I, I understand that when you say it won't ever happen again, it probably will happen. You're again. Saying it will correct the problem unless there's another COVID kind of issue. Yes. So you never know. But so what I would suggest um, is that Mr. Rosavi get with Mr. Boyd. Uh, Boyd, Mr. Boyd, superintendent, and you, if you'd like, and go through some stuff and see where there can be. Uh, I agree. Some adjustments. I agree. I think last year with the, you all had a you had like seven hundred thousand dollars left over, and we let you keep it for the projects fix some of the problems yeah but that yes but, but we didn't use that money for things like buses that were about to fall apart so we didn't have to ask to put in the capital improvement right. plans right we haven't gotten to the capital improvement i'm sorry <laughs> but so, that money had been used for things and so we didn't have to add it to that That's so i'm saying that also um in mid-year 
there might be some opportunities. Um, well, why don't we do your suggestion? I like your suggestion, sir. I'm not trying not, I'm not disrespectful or anything. Is let Mr. Rasavi, Dr. Boyd, and myself, let's get together and kind of hold off on some of these things, and then we can maybe come up with some more solutions. Well, I don't, I don't know about the word hold off, but an <laughs> opportunity to um, talk and see what can be. Um, Even in the next few days. Whenever you all are available, it's fine. We'll make ourselves available, sir. But anyhow, we, we need to um, we need to get to a budget. We need to advertise it, and then we need the fourteen day process. It's seven days prior to the public hearing, and then the board can't act until seven days after the public hearing is held. Then you can adopt the budget and approve the tax rates which would then allow the Commissioner of Revenue's Office and Treasurer's Office to move forward with their... Uh, the, the one thing we can look at is you can always amend the budget. So, uh, but it, we just got to get this done in a timely fashion because I've had extensive conversations with the auditors and it's just caused a lot of problems. And I think it's adversely affected the audit somewhat with the accruals because you were getting money that should have been accrued back to the fiscal year that wasn't because it I think what the bills didn't go out till July or something like that. So so it kind of throws everything off schedule the purpose of having two time a year uh, billing. So maybe within the next few days, sir? I I will do my best. We will do our best. Okay. He only works twenty nine hours we don't pay him yeah. any overtime. So you don't pay me any overtime so I gotta go home. So, I don't get paid at all. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the answer is not a, I don't think it's a no. It's just work things out. Um, thank you. Mr. Rizabi, I just want to be clear with the budget you've presented so far. Does it lower the tax rate? Does it keep it the same? Or does it raise? Tax, tax rate remains the same. Remains the same. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bush. Mr. Chair, too, and I just want to point out to a lot of folks, some of the localities, they just give the schools one lump sum, and then the school board figures it out. So, you know, just for just for clarification, that does happen, too. Right. So which one are we doing? Are we doing the, the four or five appropriations category, or are we doing the one lump sum? I think traditionally you've done the eight categories. I think there's eight categories. Eight categories? Yeah. Well, actually... They changed the tradition, but I'm not sure what tradition we're in these days. I wish I could tell you. Okay. But uh, my recommendation has always been the categories because the Board of Supervisors is your primary responsibility is for the finances of the county and not, not to diminish the value of the school board. But uh, in, in 32 years in Virginia, I can recall very few times the school boards have made a request that the boards of supervisors have approved. Now, there's been a couple of times it wasn't as easy as perhaps everyone would like to have been, but uh, I just think it keeps everybody better informed than just throwing a, the money in the barrel and somebody going at it. So this year, would we be in, what's our uh, local match? It's, uh, we're right, I'm recommending Twenty-four million three ninety-four nine forty-seven. I think what, that what was the, the amendment required. Pardon me. What's the state required local it's, match? It's a lot less than that. I can't tell you. Is it sixteen million something? The, when I went back through the audits, the board of supervisors was very generous with uh, the school board. I may, and I know the school board may not agree to the exact amount, but uh, but a lot of localities don't fund that much above. Uh, which you can run that report off of the state Department of Education website. Do you know the percentage of the county budget that goes to the schools? It's probably over 50%, I'm guessing. It was 52, 54 last year. I was wondering if that's increased. Okay, uh, thank you. I would have to do that, I don't know. Okay, I just wondered if you knew all. You seem to know all the other answers, so I just wondered if you knew that one. Well, we don't, we don't have any of your employees. <laughs> it's your employees. So you, you determine what you pay them and all that kind of stuff. But anyhow, let's move on to the next thing. 
Mr. Facebook will be lighting up. Go ahead, sir. Okay. Uh, then uh, we list all the debt service for each of the items, the regional jail, uh, the new elementary school. Uh, I don't know which one that is, but uh, anyway, the list is new. Uh, the, uh, the library or literary loan fund, so that has to be a school. Uh, the QSEB uh, grant, which uh, I think was done when uh, President Obama was in office, and I think you get the interest back, is my recollection of how that works. And it just keeps turning over. Uh, the refunding uh, of the bonds in 2014, which reduced uh, the interest rates that you were paying. The middle school expansion, uh, the equipment lease purchase. Um, is that the radio system or something? Yes, the radio. radio system. Okay. Then the refunding in 2019 that was completed. Uh, the bonds for the new courthouse, uh, I guess the first half. And then you did another refunding in uh, 2020. Uh, then there was another refunding uh, of new principal and interest. Uh, the, I guess the new courthouse addition, was that the second portion, second portion of the borrowing? Uh, and then the pu public facility uh, bond with the principal and interest, or just interest, I guess. For the what? Firehouse. Yeah, right. The firehouse and the preschool loan. So when when you say uh, refunding, what what does that mean? Uh, what it was, you'd have had some outstanding debt that you would have re that had been at a higher rate, and you refinanced it to a lower rate. Because uh, we did that in Westmoreland with a lot of our sewer and water bonds. Uh, invest. Oh, it has to be invested, and it's earning interest because uh, it's uh, well over a million dollars in interest that's been accrued. But what you got to be careful with is the arbitrage. You can't more earn more interest than what your interest is, because what you do then you have to pay it back to the IRS. Uh, what happened? I think it was in early 2000s. Uh, people would borrow money because it's tax exempt at a lower rate turn around and invest it uh, and got, got themselves to the attention of the IRS. So the Congress passed the law and said, wait a minute, you, you can't be borrowing money, turn around and investing it at a higher rate and making a profit. So any that's earned above that amount would have to, will have to be repaid to, uh, I'm trying to think the, which one of these is the preschool and which was a firehouse? The last one. They're combined. It's a school. Yeah, the firehouse and preschool is combined. And that's only half. Right. There was supposed to be a Santa Cruz tranche. Also, Mr. Stratt, I think you asked me a question a couple of weeks ago. I checked with uh, Davenport, who checked with the uh, bond council. That money can be used for demolition of the old school. No, no, the bond proceeds, you can use those funds are acceptable to be used to demolish the, it's the old middle school. Is that what it is? And Mr. Strava, we spoke to Davenport and they said it can be used for schools. Right. And that yes. also qualifies. Right. So if you use less for the fire department, I know originally the 15 million number, there's no problem with using for the school. I think we're at the end, Lovita, of the general fund. One question for you. So with a debt service, we're now doing 10 million compared to the previous years where we were doing, I think last year we were doing eight. That 10 million, how much of it breaks down to interest? And how much of it is the principal that we're paying down on the debt or all, is all of it interest? No. No, not all of those interest. If you look in the audit online, back in the notes, it will tell you exactly every outstanding loan 
what the principal and, and interest that's outstanding and what the next year payment is. I sat down with uh, Mrs. Lovell, is that her name? Mm -hmm. She was in the office the other day and her, her question is more specific about the service authority. So I sit down and explain to her what that debt was and I showed her where you could find all that information in an audit and she was happy because it was left and what she, whatever figure she had, but whatever she was looking at, it, it was a lot less. Thank you. And if you actually look in the audit for the bond per capita and debt, uh, the numbers are pretty good. It's, it's not that bad. Sir, sure. so before we move on to the, the uh, CIP, on this one, on page 16 uh, of the general fund? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. So uh, what we're looking at is the public safety EMS grants and under the overtime, the uh, 862,969. Uh, are you on expenditures or revenue? At the top of the page there. Expenditures. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm on the wrong page. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Strath. So the, rec the recommended amount, 862969 mm -hmm. for overtime. Yes. Um, do we know how that was computed? Like, how do we know how much overtime that we're going to need? I, I believe when I met with the sheriff, I mean, I know you have vacancies and so forth, and then it's required to fill in with overtime. So I'm presuming that's how that was calculated. Oh, was it EMS? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't hear. I thought it was Sheriff. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, what that is is what we talked about earlier. When you have vacancies, then, I mean, you're required to backfill them with your uh, existing staff to, right. to cover those shifts. And uh, I don't remember exactly how many vacancies the chief, you, you're welcome to come up and explain. But that's not, I mean, we've had those situations in Westmoreland when you have five or six vacancies. I mean, you can't shut down a shift and say we're not going to respond. Right, and, and understood. I guess, and in, in, um, in, in speaking with Chief Moody before, so I know there's challenges there, but we have 257,843 for part time, 862,969 for overtime. So, um, you know, it's like looking at a strategy to overcome, you know, what, what is the strategy? So we're not paying the overtime, which is time and a half, correct? David Moody, County Fire and Rescue Chief. Um, so there's a number of things that are folded into that overtime line. One of them is exactly what Mr. Razabi said. So if we have, so for example, I have nine vacancies um, as of January 1st. Didn't predict it. So that leaves uh, where, where people have to work to fill those roles. So you save on the salary side and you're paying on the overtime side. So there's, there's element one. Element two is, is that there's a built-in amount of overtime. So to cover 30 days, to, to cover a month, we work on a what's called a 28-day work schedule. There's 13 28-day work schedules in a year, okay? And the Fair Labor Standards Act, the federal law, says that if a firefighter working their 207K, that's the, that's the portion in the Fair Labor Standards Act, that if they work beyond... 56 hours? Yes, correct. So where, where a normal individual works, they work, if they work more than 40 hours in a seven-day work period, they earn time and a half. However, 
the Fair Labor Standards Act, the federal government, says if you have a firefighter, you can expand your work period all the way up to a 28-day period. And if they work more than 212 hours in a 28-day work period, then they're subject to time and a half. Okay? So the normal schedule for two of the shifts is 216 hours. So there's four hours of automatic overtime for two shifts. In order to get to cover 28 days, you have to have one shift work 10 shifts and two shifts work nine shifts apiece, okay, to, to get 28 days, 10 and 18. That shift that works the 10th shift, the, the, and it rotates, ha, the whole shift has to, has to earn overtime. Or you can give them off. If you give them off, you got to have somebody else work. So this is so we have a three shift platoon. That the answer to your to your question, Supervisor Stroud, would be what we would need to do is add a new shift to minimize the overtime earnings. However, that would come at a greater, much greater cost than eight hundred thousand dollars. So that's that's the big element. Element three. That overtime line also includes your 15 county holidays. So we have to pay the individuals time and a half for eight hour for eight, an eight hour period if if they working holidays. You also have four premium holidays that's in your personnel policy. Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, and Fourth of July. That comes at double time and a half. So you pay them their normal part, and then they make an additional time and a half for eight hours. So there's a, there's a lot to it. There's also the late calls. There's also some of the mandatory training. I think we, we, we estimate roughly 72 hours a year of mandatory training that takes place when they're not on duty. So there is a formula. Um, and we just, we put it down the way the cards fall. And some years you save on it and, you know, I'd much rather build a little bit of a cushion in there. I don't know when we're going to have a major disaster. I try to build some cushion in there for that. If we had a hurricane and I have to, I have to call in, you know, additional shifts. If we have a winter event like we had a couple years ago and I have to hold people over. <laughs> COVID was a whole whole ordeal all all in of itself that generated a whole lot of overtime. Let me give you a let me give you a fourth element. Virginia law says that we have to that if you have a firefighter working a 207k schedule by the Fair Labor Standards Act that you have to if you have to count their hours of leave as hours worked in relation to overtime. So this is what it means. And I can provide you the state code section if you'd like. This is what it means, is that if you have a firefighter that, that they work 10 shifts in that 28-day cycle and they call out one shift, they're sick. But then they work another shift overtime, state law says you have to pay them time and a half. Normal circumstances, if uh, somebody who qualified for overtime, if you take a day's leave and that you don't get paid over until you work the 41st hour. It's different with the regulation for fire department. So, okay. So, does that answer your question, sir? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thanks, sir. <clears throat> okay. Go ahead, sir. Okay, are we done with the general fund then? Okay. We want to wait till Mr. Solomon comes back or keep going? Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm going to let Levita, these other smaller funds, let her go ahead and explain those because they're not quite the I didn't spend as much time on this. <laughs> All right, so next we have the Fund 120, which is the library fund. 
si estoy de acuerdo. Esto es cosa de revenue for the lab area. Right after the general fund. Yeah, once you go to the, the revenue side. Right now you're at the bottom of the end of the year. Mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. And then you hit revenues, okay? Keep going up. Keep going. All right, hold up. Okay, let's go up from we're gonna go to fund one twenty. Have a hot day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, let's go to 120 and not bend down. <laughs> okay. There you go. Okay. So we're going to look at the revenue for um, the library. So when I looked at this. I wanted to make sure that we were actually estimating our revenues based on um, or in line with what we've been receiving in the last few years. So their interest on their deposit and their in investment, I estimated that at $24,696. Um, if you go down their charges for um, services, their TSYS fees, that's the money we make back off of any credit card charges. So it's it's very minimal, so we just estimated that at $25. Um, miscellaneous revenue, just to keep in line, I estimated that at $23,000, and that could just be any small amount that they receive, any kind of revenue that we don't account for on a normal basis. Um, our library state aid, if you go down, Chris, that came in at $215,095. And that's actually on the expenditure side as well. And that's what the library gets for their state, um, from the state for books. So we estimate that on revenue, on the revenue side as well, because we get that from the state. Yes. Yep. Every year, it seems to increase a little bit every year. And the transfer from the general fund, that's at $626,013. And the way I arrive at that amount, is I take their um, expenditure request and I left out any miscellaneous revenue, any TSYS fees, and then their state aid. And so then we have to um, fill in the gap. And so our um, transfer to the library will be $626,013. Since we're paying the difference. Since, yeah, we're paying the difference basically in their account. So. Um, Total fund for the library is $888,829. I have a quick question on that. How much exactly, the, I know they have from Mrs. Smoot many years ago, Have how much is exactly in the trust? That will go. Because that is an investment, correct? Yes, that's in a different fund. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, but yeah, that they, does factor in, because I've had other supervisors from other localities ask me that question. Yeah, so they keep that in uh, what they call their endowment fund. Mm -hmm. So that money is in, in two different funds. It's not um, a part of what we look at when we look at their whole overall budget. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. So that looks like a really big jump. Um, From 809, 108 to 829 for the mm -hmm. final total. So yeah, the increase will be in what we give them. And because on the expenditure side, so if we look at the expenditure side, then we can kind of backtrack into both and we'll see why that increases.
I got a question. Okay. Mm -hmm. So just so just to make sure I'm reading it right. So last year the budget was five seventy three and we used three ninety six. Is that right? No, last year the budget was eight oh nine one oh eight. Oh, I'm talking. I'm sorry. I'm talking about the transfer from general fund. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So last year it, yeah, it was five seventy three seven ninety, and so far we've only transferred three ninety six seven twenty five. So we transfer um, one twelve each month. So we don't give it to them all at one time. We do it every month. We break it out. If there's funds left over in that, because it seems like to me there's a chance there will be, right? If there's ever funds left there, which there normally is not, it comes back to the general fund. That's the kind of stuff though, that I like to track. Because I, what I don't want to see, and it, you know, I was coaching football, did all those things, but what I, I don't want to see is, hey, we have extra money left there, we have to spend it before the end of the year, type stuff from in any department. You know, just to, just mm -hmm. to spend it, to spend it. That's why the six twenty six, that big jump. I think it's concerning for some of us because I, we don't, I don't want it just spent to be spent. I've been through that stage before with other things where it's like, hey, we got money left over in AD from the high school would say, and we got to spend this $20,000 or they're going to make us give it back. So they go to coaches so they spend the money, you know. State law says any funds that are unexpended revert back to the general fund. That's what the mm -hmm. state law says. All right, thank you. All right. With the federal government operating. <laughs> so typically, the library is, is very good about that. I normally don't have to worry about you know them just going on a spending spree. What you'll see um, the increase there with the library is basically in their salary and the three percent that we've added. So that's really where that comes in at. So that's how we got to the eight eight eight. So Chris, let's, can we go down to the expenditure side, Chris? And then that way we can kind of go back. And I think that'll help kind of fill in some of the gaps for you all. Is the library open six days a week? Or? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, as Nora mentioned, throughout the general fund, we added uh, three percent to the to the salary, um, so that we didn't have to go back later and then do a transfer and all of that because it causes more work down the line. So. Um, their salaries and wages regular. We made that 253.17. Their part time is 216,391. And then if you just look at their um, FICA, 35,909. 19,650 for uh, VRS retirement, that's plan one and plan two. Then you have your VRS hybrid, 15,122. Health insurance, as we all know, health insurance went up. So that is now $54,705. Your life insurance is $3,390. Disability is $502. Workers comp, because they're in a different fund, that remains there, um, is $423. Professional service, which is for them is their um, audit piece that they pay for, is $2,400. Uh, professional service is other, $10,187. Let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. is, that 10, is that a separate audit or is it part of the... That, that is separate. Okay, so it's a different audit than what Rob mm -hmm. Obama talked to? Okay. Yes, sir. Ma'am, mm -hmm. so I know you're moving down the list, but can you scroll back up a little bit? Okay, so on there, maybe just one more time. Okay, so we see the actual... The actuals for 21, 22, 23. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at the part time box. So the actual of 21 was 78,000. Then 121,000. 165,000. 
in the adopted budget was 206. So we're talking about a $40,000 increase. In the actual it was 136. So the actual was 70,000 less than the budget. But now we can go back and we're requesting to go back up to a budget that has never even been touched. The highest that the actual has been is 165. Why would we adopt a budget for an additional $50,000 that we've never even came close to for part time? Right. Well, let's keep in mind that we have not finished a year yet. So our actuals are not for the full year. The actuals are just up until the report was run. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, her new budget request includes an increase in her part-time salary for minimum wage. She does that every year to make sure that her part-time people are in line for minimum wage. So that's why her part-time line kind of increases um, every year because she does not have a lot of full-time staff. I think it's like three or four of them that may be full-time and then the rest is part-time. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't have a, a problem with that. It's just $50,000 seems like a lot. I mean, and if they're getting their increase, and that's fine. It's just, it, it doesn't, you know, I'm, looking, I'm just looking at the math over the years, and they never come anywhere near that. So even with a, you know, with a, a part-time minimum wage increase, to hit 50000 seemed like a mm -hmm. lot. That's why I asked that. Is that the number that they request? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it does seem to be a significant jump. But, I mean, I don't know how many people she has. So. Um, yeah. For the actual report, when was it run? Does that reflect like 75% of the year or what? I'll tell you up on top of the 410 today. It, and tells you the time to right at the top of the page. That way we don't get it confused when we print out different copies during the day. I was just going to throw out a suggestion. If, if we have a lot of questions on the budget, maybe our next meeting we bring the, the library director to answer some of those questions. Right, that's what I was going to ask. It's going to be, is it the will of the board to have um, Ms. Tenney come before you all just to answer your questions regarding her? Well, I, I was thinking this, I'll speak. I, what the concern is, we know that like the 136 of this year, that the year's not done, but there's only, if I'm not mistaken, there's like three months left based mm -hmm. on right. a budget of 206. So they, we shouldn't be seeing probably $70,000 being spent over the next three months to make mm -hmm. up. So that's why I think Mr. Strauss looked at the 216 going, man, we've never even hit that close. Why would we not just keep it, the adopted budget at the 206 where we were at before? And you know, maybe we're a couple of years or a year ahead of what we were supposed to be and just kind of kick it back to 206 and just keep the $10,000 out. I mean, that would be what I would suggest. Right. Just keep it the same. We've never hit that mark. Mm -hmm. It's up to the board if they agree. It's the will. So, can you say again, what are we voting on? Taking $10,000 out of that particular line item? Yeah, yeah I'm fine with that. Yes, Mr. Strauss said yes, Mr. Davis said yes, Mr. Daniel. I would at least like to hear what that 1000 is because we maybe there is, I mean, no, we're making decisions on the fly here, but, you know, I would like to at least know from that department head what that is, at least give them a chance to to explain what it is. And I think Chris might. So there's there's three. So they can come and explain, but there's three to cut it out. Put down ten. One, two, three. I, I understand that, but in we're doing this a little differently and change is good, but you know. We've done something in the past and we can adapt, but I at least like to hear from them. I know I'm being outvoted, but I'm just making at least to at least hear. And I think Mr. Dines, she might be online. Well, I think she's in her building and she might walk over if you want to have her answer your questions in person. That's fine. We can, we can come back to it. But, and um, we're not doing this just, you're saying on the fly. 
because we're looking at the numbers and we're doing math and that's what we're basing it on. I'm not, you know, finance a little better than me. I would like to, I'm, I'm an ask questions person. So I would like to ask questions, which I appreciate your financial knowledge. I just, that's, I think a little differently. So I'd like to ask the questions, but it might come to the same conclusion in the end. It's just. Right, can we move on? Okay. Do you want to stay with this one and go to a different spot or go to a different spot? One of the Keep things going from there, one of the things we can do, even if you adopt the budget, when you do the appropriation, you're going to appropriate less. This is only for plan fiscal and planning purposes. So once the conversation is had with, I guess, the library director, uh, if you decide something different, then you would just appropriate less. Okay. And thank you very much, Professor. That, that's good to know. Um, I think kind of what we're trying to do with this is we're trying to balance the budget. Right. And I understand. Yes, sir. So if I could just add to, um, to, to address, yeah, we'll kind of do it on the fly, but if you, using that analogy, if you use the glide slope of, uh, and, and com compute where we are for the rest of the year, it brings it up to about 186, 187,000. You add 3% to that, you're still only at, uh, 190 something thousand, well below 216. So I, I think we're safe taking some away from this. I'm just cut, go ahead, please. Okay. I think I kind of lost my place where I was at. Oh, I, I know we did professional services, other, okay. Uh, contracted repair and maintenance is $1,000. Maintenance service contract, 24,948. Advertising, 700. So the library has a vehicle? Yes, sir. Um, postage, 1,320. Telephone, 10,584. Surety bond, 703. Lease and rental equipment, so there's their copy machines and all that thing, um, all of that stuff, 6,813. Travel and training, 2,295. Dues and membership, 925. Refunds, 100. Office supplies, $5,000. We move down. Uh huh. I, I know, I'm sorry to stop you, but the vehicle, so do, do they have a bookmobile? No, sir, no. Do they go pick up kids and bring them there? You know, hold on. You know what? I think I missed. Look, did you stick out there? They turned in their vehicle, didn't they? Yeah, it was broke down. Hold on. There is something. It's not the vehicle. I looked at the wrong line. Give me one second. Repair and maintenance 3310 is for building repairs and maintenance, not so vehicle repair. Doesn't, doesn't the uh, building and grounds do the building repair maintenance, Mr. Murphy? They, they do. Yeah. So that could be removed? Yeah. Now what we, Mike, are we, I'm sorry. I'm probably out of line. So first the vehicle. Yeah, there is no vehicle. There is no vehicle, so no, that's comes out. Mm -hmm. Now what I was gonna ask is with DSS, what we've been doing is when general properties, when they do um, fix anything in their building, we build them because they get state funds. And then that is uh, returned to the general fund. So um, when they when the building and grounds goes to the library, changes the light switches, changes the keypads, and everything else, you take money out of their fund and put it in their fund. No. Okay. So that means that one can come out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can we can take that out. Okay, thank you. Because you're going to invoice this, right? Well, if we take it out, we can't invoice. They won't have money to pay for. What I was asking Mike is we're currently not doing that. We're not invoicing them. I'm thinking that's something, a new way for us to. Does um, the county own the library building? <laughs> yes. It's a very complicated yes, thing. This is smooth. It's very eccentric. And so while we serve as Board of Supervisor members, we, we technically own the library. It's the weirdest endowment that you've ever seen, but but that this is this is smooth. So it should be covered by different <laughs> yeah. property. Yes, I think yes. we should take it out because I think it's adding to it. 
or you can add, add that to general properties. Yeah, I think he has enough in his budget for maintenance and everything. Okay. <laughs> so, if oh, the board is a middle oh, allowed to move the one thousand dollars. <laughs> I, I told him he's going to need to start running bingo. So. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So that's is that a consensus of the board? Ms. Stroud. Yes. Ms. Stroud. Yes, sir. Mr. Davis. Yes. All righty. Thank you. Okay. And then we got down to um, library books, state aid, which is what the state is going to give them. So that is. That's what it is, $215,095. And so, of course, that's going to change the bottom line once I go in and make those adjustments. Ms. Cobb, I, I wanted to clarify the audience that sometimes you see these, they're pass through funds. The, the federal or state gives us money and we have to put it in our general fund. And that is then, correct. Yeah, and so it, it shows us that we're paying for it, but we're not really, it's just a pass through. Correct. <laughs> All right, so we'll come back to get that. But that was fine, 120. No, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But isn't she in the general fund we're going to change? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay that's fine. Yeah. Okay, Chris, can you go to tourism fund 140 revenue? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so while Chris is looking for that, I'll just um, give a little background on tourism and some changes that Norm and I um, discussed and made this, uh, well, for the upcoming fiscal year. So, Ms. Amy Southall, our community engagement coordinator, she is currently in um, the general fund. But if I'm not mistaken, some of her roles may be changing. So, she has been, her and all of her expenses, had been moved to the tourism budget. So you see that the tourism budget has increased um, and subsequently we had to increase the revenue. But as we all know, tourism has a good fund balance to handle um, that. I, I spoke to Mr. Stewart, I've read the statute, he's reviewed it and he feels a portion of it, whatever portion she does for tourism can be covered through the tourism fund. That also accounts for the one employee that is also comes from the tourism fund, right? That is correct. Part time. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But we have one more employee in the economic development, correct? Is I, that... lim I eliminate, eliminated the, I'm not sure what the position was called, but. The specialist. So you left the director position what? in the economic development budget right. and just eliminated the economic yeah. development specialist position. Because it was vacant. So that was a grant writer, I guess. Was it what? Uh, she oh, was, yeah, sure. she was somewhat of a grant writer. Yeah, I just need to, because, you know, we do have an employee that does both work. I want to make sure that still has her position and it's taken yes, care of. That, yes, matter of fact, the one that is currently there that is part time, she's always been funded for tourism. Okay, mm -hmm. I just want to make sure and clarify that. Yeah, no, she's okay. So, because we before we go to the, the grant writer, I'm not familiar with any grants that have been written by the grant writer. The um, Ralph Bunch Roof Grant was written by Ms. Kimberly Cook when she was in that position. Right, but she's been out of that position. I'm talking about who's in it now. Oh, I don't know who's anything about it. Vacant. Okay, there is there is there is, there is no grant writer. Is the answer to the question. Okay, thank you. So that, I mean, my recommendation was to eliminate that because to have uh, Amy come over and help, I see that being more aligned with what her 
abilities and, and, and training. I have a question. I, I may have been confused. I thought that there was um that there was a a, a paid a person in the tour. Like it was a small amount of money, but it was dedicated to paid is that was that am I not right in that? In tourism? Yes. Yes, that was to cover the part time position. Okay. Is that not listed on here? It is. It's still on there. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what I was talking about. Yeah, that's on the expenditure side. So the revenue side for the tourism budget is just one line. And we list it as um, transit occupancy taxes. And so we estimated that as $330,480, which is what's going to match the expenditure. Now, if you're looking at your um, sheets right now, it looks like that money is not coming in. However, like I said at the beginning, tourism has a hefty fund balance. So that's where that money is going to ultimately come from because that's what tourism pulls most of their expenditures from. It's from this um, fund balance. I believe the state law says, too, on that tax, is it above 3%? Or above two percent, mm -hmm. that the hotel has to be transferred to the tour. I can't remember the exact. Yeah, and we break it out sixty forty. Right, and so you transfer from mm -hmm. it goes into the general fund, and then she transfers the appropriate sum each quarter. To that. To yes, that's what I did. Mr. Stets. So we eliminated the grant writing. The person who was doing the grant writing. Where is that role now? Is it been transferred to somebody who's doing the grant writing, or is that position completely gone? Because I, I do believe grant writing is an important position, even if it was just, you know, if we had only seen a couple of success stories. I think that uh, I can only speak of when at West Wallen, we use the Planning District Commission, which has a lot of planners and people who can perform that function. And I think Kathy has made the inquiry to the regional PDC that you're a member of. But uh, to be quite honest with you, there's a lot made about grant writing, like it's something that you need to be a rocket scientist. And if I can do it, anybody can do it. And so uh, we have a lot of professional people that the board has in their employ. So I don't think that's going to be a problem, to be honest with you. Thank you. All right, Ms. Gomez, see if we can keep on going here. Okay, so we'll go through the expenditures. Because this one is quick. As I mentioned, we moved um, Ms. Southall. We moved her and all of her expenses over to tourism funds. So that's where you'll see her salary, um, the part-time line. It, it accounts for um, the current part-timer in addition to the intern. The, the advertising for the public notices, mm -hmm. um, it was coming out of the, um, the um, Board of Supervisor budget, and it was 300% higher than it has been in years past because of all the public. So where is that money coming from on this particular budget? Is it coming out of hers, where it says advertising? Yeah, let or is me it coming out of that's a good question. Administrative, or is it coming out of the board of supervisors again? Give me one second. Let me look at it. And Mr. Budget. Collins, I want to jump on there because I did look into that, and and I don't know why it was done that way last year, and just for the public to know that the board of supervisors budget was yeah, but well, it was being charged for every public hearing that we had to do legally, whatever. Um, you know, every public hearing, it was charged to, to the supervisor's account, which after I think the second meeting went over budget, and that was in July, the second public hearing. And, and if anybody looks at the bills I've been signing them, to advertise in the Freelance Star is quite expensive, from $400 to $1,000 every time you have to put a notice in. Is the Westmoreland News considered to be a paper of local <laughs> jurisdiction? I don't think so. No Facebook friends. I can tell you it's cheaper. <laughs> yeah, I think one of our staff knows the answer. Oh, the publication? Um, the publication for notice, notice of... Um, notice. No, that's not actually not... No. Ms. Greg, so, if you're going to speak, please come to the mic. Introduce yourself. 
and answer the question. My name is Roan Grapes, and I'm the administrative assistant in economic development and tourism. And I thought the question was about the advertising in the tourism budget, where yeah, I think you, all the money, um, my understanding is all the money in the tourism budget comes from the tourism fund, mm -hmm. comes from, from that hotel tax. So and the reason my, we my did that was so we can. The public hearings and all the stuff that goes in the paper that costs us $100,000 a year. That still comes from Board of Supervisors budget. Well, that needs to come out of the Board of Supervisors because it artificially inflates um, the Board of Supervisors. So it needs to be into the administrative budget. I think legally you could prorate what portion of that ad that was for tourism from that. And I assume Mr. Stewart is back there that for issues pertaining to uh, land use and so forth could be paid from his budget. Yes, that's what, that's what we did. Okay. The only okay. Um, public hearing that is related to the Board of Supervisors, budget work sessions, things of that nature come from the Board of Supervisors budget. If it's relating to tourism, that comes from their budget um, and so on and so forth. But are we accounting to make sure it's properly accounted for or budgeted? Because obviously, yes. if we were way over budget, it's because somebody didn't account for it correctly that we were going to have all those public hearings. Right, because, yeah, that year, it was because we didn't know that mm -hmm. we would have all of those hearings. So that's why that particular year went over budget. Otherwise, it's accounted for um, correct. But I think um, what Mr. Rasabi has in place was put in the budget transfer form. I think that'll help us catch these things before they, they get out of line. So if we see that we're going to run short in advertising, then that's a conversation that we can have ahead of time as far as, you know, instead of doing it later on. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Questions real quick. What part of the salary goes to, is there, is there something paid to the, um, the head of the tourism? No. There's no nothing paid to that. Not from that. Not to my knowledge. Not out of here. You said to the head of tourism. Yeah. Who's who's the lead, who's the person over tourism right now? Yeah. Well, Amy's not. She's not. Who is um? Oh, it was Nick Meyer. He was the um, coordinator of the tax. Right. Mm -hmm. But you have a, a tourism advisory committee as a chairman, just like the there's a planning commission and. Mr. Stewart um, gets things ready for them. We have the same with that. Do we not? Do we not appoint like an interim? Or is, Chris, are you still in that? Or yeah, are you Mr. Filling? Clark's been acting He's in that role. That's what I'm asking. Isn't that role that you're filling in, in, in the tours? Mr. Right Mr. Clark, please introduce yourself. Short and sweet, please. Creation. Um, now, to the best of my knowledge, that we have not filled the tours and director position unless that's I think that's kind of what Ms. Southall is going to do. I brought the last applications because I had been at the last tourism advisory committee meeting and was familiar with them. Okay. I thought you were acting in some interim capacity of that. I, I don't know. There's nothing official with that. I had them and I he, he answers the nine one one calls. When yeah. Call over okay. Yeah I I I, I work next to the firehouse so I put out different kinds of fire. All right. Thank you, sir. Sorry. Sorry to uh, Ms. Southall says she's still here if you need any, ask her any questions. Not at this time. Go ahead, Ms. Cox. Okay. okay, I know time is getting late, so I will go through this um, quite quickly. So, um, because she is in a separate fund, has her own fund, workers' comp stays in there at $73. Um, dollars. Uh, professional services, other $64,646. 5000 for maintenance service contract, uh, 39000 for printing and binding, advertising is 23000 postal service 500 cell phone $492, travel and training 8000 dues and membership 10000 office supplies 1000 bringing up bringing us to a total of $330,480. Ms. Cobb. Mm -hmm. Does every employee of the county have a cell phone? No, sir. Okay. Seems to be a lot of cell phones. All right. Thank you. Keep moving on. 
Yeah, uh, travel and training. Is that the thing? You have a question, sir? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Travel and training is going up a lot. Um, can you explain that? So, yes, she has um, the Virginia 01 Summit, the two people, 2,500. Uh, let's see. She has several different trainings, uh, 3CMA, NIOA. I'm not sure what these acronyms are. Um, with five thousand dollars, that's really the bulk of the training, and then online course training is five hundred dollars. So we would probably need to explain what the acronyms are. I'm not sure what they are. What's the two people? Yeah. So it looks like the two people were probably more more than likely her and Ron. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next is Fund 204, our Rec Activity Fund. Okay. 204 revenue. And Mr. Rasavi and I, um, well, he talked with Chris, uh, Mr. Chris Clark, and we believe we got the revenues more closely to um, what we're receiving. As Chris gets there. Okay. Okay, as we all know that the REC Fund 204 is a standalone fund and it's based on our general programs and athletic uh, funds from Parks and Rec. So general program fees, we're estimating 300,000 and then of athletic programs, 254,344 bringing our total REC fund to $554,344. And then if we go to the expenditure side. Sure, one page, but. Mm -hmm. Okay, on the expenditure side, um, part time, we have 200,000, FICA 15,300, workers' comp 4,460, professional services criminal is 1,450. Parks and Rec, they run their own background checks on employees. Um, professional services, other, 27,000. Postage, 100. Lease and rent of equipment, 500. Travel and training, 1,280. Office supplies, 300. Food supplies, 7,000. Uniforms and wearing apparel, 1,950. Education and recreation supplies, 35,000. So that brings us for uh, just general rec programs, $294,340. Yes, sir. So it, it kind of looks like the same thing we saw earlier on this. If you go to the top of this before we get off the sheet, go back mm -hmm. to the top. And professional under the professional services, other. So we have a recommendation of 27000 They've never exceeded ten thousand. Why, whenever the actuals have never, they've never even exceeded eight nine thousand, but we're recommending three times that much. Again, Mr. Chris Clark, Parks and Recreation. One of those items that we pay from that is our bus trips, and with COVID, bus trips stopped. So that was fiscal year twenty twenty one. Um, we did our first trip again this past fall. So that's one of the items that comes out of there. It could be more substantial. So you pay to go in the clusters. So we're, we're, I see an advertising. You pay to go in the clusters. Right. Yes. You all that money? All, this, all these funds for these two accounts are paid for through the, the program. fees that the people pay. None of this, this port, neither of these portions are paid through any tax money and so forth. So. I mean, if he doesn't, 
get the people to go on the trips, then there won't be the expenditure. Okay. Yeah. So what's what's the fund balance? Four thirty-five is where we were before last week, I think. And then we took it. We moved eighty thousand for the lights at Sealston. And what's the request? Uh, I, I mean, I just didn't know why we were. If we're not using it, why we're budgeting it? Well, it's, it depends on the program. Like we could have somebody come to us who says, "I want, I want to teach a, a cooking class." And so, I'm, all right, we'll put you on. Well, that's, we're going to contract with them. We're going to play a 70 30 split. Then we're, that's going to be a contracted service, other, because it doesn't really fit. It's not a maintenance or one of those other categories. We're kind of stuck sometimes with the general government categories that go with each number. It makes it kind of confusing. Well, that, so last year it was 700 and some thousand balance. And now it's 435. Um, as of today, 469. Four sixty nine. Four hundred sixty nine thousand eight hundred fifty three dollars and seventy six cents. Do we know what happened to that money? The seven thirty five was tourism. The tourism fund was at seven thirty five a couple weeks ago. So you bring in a lot more than you spent. Uh, we try not to bring in a lot more than we spend. We try to be you know as close. To, we don't want to overcharge people for programs, but some of the programs have an excess. That pay for free special events. So our Halloween trunk or tree um, is a is a low is a free event. Different events like that. But so every year, there's generally at least two hundred thousand dollars more than what you're expending. Generally speaking, there's leftover funds. There's leftover funds. Right. Yeah, okay. uh, we've never we've never cleared two hundred thousand dollars in a, in a fiscal year. That would so that be impossible. I think it just carries forward. Right. So it can never be. We can never use it for other things. It has to stay in that fund. Uh, it's my understanding that the Board of Supervisors set this up and made this requirement, although nobody can seem to put their hands yeah, I mean, on, it was... on what the, uh, you know, because the one question I asked, uh, a lot of the fees that we used to collect when we had a rec department, a portion of that went to help subsidize some of the administrative staff. But I, we can't find whatever... If there was a re whatever the board adopted at that time to do this, nobody can seem to. So there's no requirement by law. So whatever the yeah. board adopted basically is unknown and can't be found. So it doesn't exist. Well, you can change it at any time. There's no. Okay, that was that was legal question. requirement. Yes, thank you. This may be something we work with Mr. Clark on moving forward. Yeah. Like the year before I got here, we bought the the 15 passenger van that the department has was purchased from the from the from the from the fund balance because it's a program use vehicle. Look forward to working with you on that, sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, so last week um, at the uh, the meeting, there was a public comment that some of the fields have ruts in them and. They're in, in poor shape. Can we use some of this funds to uh, smooth that out and make those fields a little bit more playable? Mr. Clark, hold on. Don't come up unless I ask you, please. So I, I, I do understand what you're talking about. So um, wouldn't that be in a capital improvement that you could transfer that fund into that for that purpose? You, you could do that, but you could use it directly from this fund if you chose. Matter of fact, I stopped up to look at those fields and uh, I've had some communication with Chris about the extension service, doing some soil samples and so forth. And the lady was pretty much in the bullseye on uh, those fields are top. And uh, it, it may, you may need to bring even some topsoil in or something because some of those spots, you ain't going to get anything to grow. So can we get that money from this fund? Yes. I mean, my opinion, that there's no restriction in the state code that I'm for. That, that's what I was interested in. Yes. So I saw those complaints and I've heard them from a lot of folks. So I, I'd, I'd be willing to do that when the time comes to do that. Right. And that's kind of what I was thinking whenever I was talking to Mr. Clark about us putting a plan together where he used some of that funds to really make things better for people right. and, and resolve some of these challenges that people are bringing forth. You know, I believe my uh, experience has been that's normally done in the fall, correct, Chris? 
Come on, Mr. Clark. <laughs> so we have a, a plan set out for this year, um, and it started with, because those were Bermuda grass fields, the, the, seed, the grass is still dormant, um, but you start with non-select to kill anything that should, uh, shouldn't be there. Well, because we don't have irrigation on those fields, they're, they're harder to maintain because we don't get enough water and for the Bermuda. And so the non-select has done its job and all the Bermuda is still dormant. And so it's gonna get fed in the next month or so. It's, it's, uh, if that's its next thing on the plan and then it hopefully it will jump up. But we unfortunately we had to get worse to get better because we had to take weeds out first. And so we're, we're, we're kind of chasing our tail, but we now have funds for that. Prior to fiscal year 22, I guess, the funds for turf maintenance were very limited. And now we've got a plan. It's, it's, in the, it's in the administration budget of these are the things we're doing on these fields to make sure that we get to where hopefully we can host sports tours and events and we're marketable on that, that aspect, as well as being very good for our citizens. Thanks. So I appreciate the, the the turf maintenance, but there was also some discussion about ruts. Like, I don't know if it's got wet and you know people have driven across it or what. Is, is there a plan to kind of work that out? It's yeah, uh, you know, with the yeah, to top dress the field, we're going to either have to rent or hopefully borrow from a uh, a district, you know, regional partner, a uh, top dresser, and do things like that. But yeah, it's once it, we're we're one step at a time because it's it's. We've got, I've got four full-time guys in, in that department. It makes it really difficult to take care of all the acres we do. All righty. Okay, now we can move forward with the um, athletic program expenditures. So part-time, we have 125,000. Part-time overtime is 4,140. And that is for the parks workers um, when they have tournaments and everything, he pays overtime for that. Um, FICA, 9,879. Workers' Comp, 2,880. Professional Services Criminal, 2,100. Professional Services Other is 46,000. Lease and rent of equipment, 11,200. And the bulk of that seems to be the line marking robot um, that was purchased last year, I believe. So this would be 30, okay. Um, travel and training is 2,000. Dues and membership, 5,655. Office supplies, 400. Food supplies, 1,000. Janitorial supplies, 3,000. Repair and maintenance supplies, 3,250. <laughs> Uniforms and wearing apparel, 25,000. Education, recreation supplies, 10,000. Other operating supplies, 8,500, bringing us to a total of $260,004. Yes, sir. So uniforms and wearing apparel, I'm assuming this is for the, the staff no. Is it for rapping? So this, yes. Yeah, so this is for um, it's basketball uniforms, um, soccer uniforms, gymnastics. So what happens is the county has to do a purchase order, and we pay for it in advance. And then um, when they're paid through the program, then that's how the money comes. Got it. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Stats, just one question. The 1,000 for food, I would be inept if I didn't ask what uh, the 1,000 for food was for. Yeah, it just says used for children's special events, top programs, and skills training events. Yeah, so, well, you might be on the, you're, you're on the athletics one. I don't know. Um, <laughs> part of that is like if we have a coaches meeting that we're going to do or do a coaches training, we'll we'll buy pizza and feed, make kind of encourage them there because we want it to be required, but it's hard to necessarily require it all the time. So with those kind of things, and then we do have staff in the win in the winter when they're working all day an all day shift, we build a half hour into the schedule for that lunch break and pick up a couple pizzas for minimum wage employees. Thank you. A 
Okay, we'll move on to fund 205, which is the law enforcement project fund. Christine, go to the revenue. Okay, so fund 205 is the law enforcement, um, law enforcement project fund, and the sheriff basically uses this fund to purchase items for like national night out and um, things of that nature. So when we're looking at the revenue, uh, miscellaneous revenue, because they'll get donations here and there, you know, sometimes throughout the year. So we estimated that, that at $2,545. Um, other donations, which are unrestricted, um, estimated that at $18,000. So that comes, it, it's a little, when we're dealing with that, it's a little hard to estimate those revenues, those donations, because you don't know what they're going to get so but they do have a fund balance that we typically um if they spend and don't have it, it it'll draw from the fund balance so there's always money there to cover um any expenditures and keep in mind it's not a part of the fund balance. i mean the general fund and according to the code of virginia we cannot put this fund with the general fund so we have to keep these two separate and just we can't co me with the fund Um, in order to make the budget balance, we use $30,465 of the uh, reserve just to make sure that expenditures and crystal down some, please. Okay, right there. Yeah, just to make sure everything balanced. So this overall budget is $51,000. Then if you go to the expenditure side, sorry, Chris, fund 205 expenditures. Okay. And then the sheriff has his, let's see, special police operations, 15,000. Their program, I'm sorry. Sorry, what is that? The special police operations? That's a huge. huge the sheriff problem. would have to speak to that. I'm sorry. Sheriff Jones. Chris Giles, Sheriff, what's your? I'm sorry, Mr. Jones. What's your question? Sorry, I'm just wondering what the special police op of operations is because the adopted budget last year was fifteen thousand, but actual spent was three forty so far. That that was for any miscellaneous operations, usually for um undercover operations drug operations or something like that that we would need to pull some funds for to uh to purchase narcotics or something like that kind of a shock absorber sort of thing <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay moving forward so their program was 7500 federal asset forfeiture 858 local evidence sees assets 10,000 State asset forfeiture, 2107. Other operating supplies and donations, 1000. Project Lifesaver, $3,545. National Night Out, 2000. Shop with a Chair, 6000. And National Telecommunications is $3,000. Bring the whole budget to $51,010. All right, go on, please. Any questions? No questions. I'm done. You're done. Okay. 
Yeah, they left from the school system, so I guess they don't get any money. Mr. Chair? Mr. Collins, can we take a five minute break to walk around and wake up? Yes, sir, don't go too far. We are now in um, recess for five minutes. <laughs>
All righty. Everybody good? I'm going to reconvene the meeting. That's okay. Reconvene the meeting at 526. Mr. Chair, if I may. Yes, sir, you may. I'm going to bring up something only because we're, we're kind of on a, a deadline and you guys have done this before, so I don't think it'd be an issue, but we are on a deadline for April 15th as far as putting a letter of support for Lake Caledon, something that we just sent to the Virginia government. We need to do it about every year. And I just didn't know if we could make a motion to do that so we can get that thing done before our time runs out or if that's just not appropriate for you, that's fine. It's fine with me, but they've already appropriated the state, with the state budget pretty much. So they're not getting money for it, but we can send them a resolution again. Go ahead and read it. Um, the motion if you'd like. Uh, I make a motion to send a letter of support for Lake Caledon from the current supervisors to the, I think, the Virginia State Legislation. Is that what it would be to? Well, it would be to our representatives. Yeah, to our representatives in support of that. Okay, second. I second. Yeah, we second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Great, sir. Okay. Uh, the next is the, the school fund, and I'm not going to go through all those items because uh, basically uh, what I've recommended is the lower amount, uh, not the 1.7. So uh, unless someone feels compelled for me to go through all those numbers, uh, my recommendation is, is what it is in the general fund. Okay. Go ahead, sir. Seeing none. Okay. And then the uh, school grants fund, that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, you know, unless somebody has a specific question under that, but that's all grant revenue. That's correct. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's where the mistake occurred. They put it in the, spe the special fund, then they put it in the, their operating fund as well. Correct. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's got corrected. So if there's no questions on that, we'll move on. Seeing none. Okay. Then uh, shows the group, the, what's that, where am I at? The ca cafeteria fund? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And uh, I'm somewhat surprised most cafeteria funds around the Commonwealth have to be subsidized, but I think I read in the audit there was a fund balance uh, for this, so that was kind of surprising. Yeah. That, that is correct, but um, I believe she's going to be coming to the board here um, very soon because as a requirement of the state, she has to use a certain percentage of her fund balance. She has way too much. We can all go over there and eat, I guess, and <laughs> throw a big party. After your background check. <laughs> yes, I won't be eating over there. Then. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> then the capital improvement fund, uh, we've, uh, Levita and I worked on this this morning. I didn't feel comfortable, nor did she, with the, the landfill fees that were projected by uh, whoever projected them prior to us. So we've reduced those uh, amounts. And of course, as I said earlier, we're transferring, rather than money to the debt service fund, we're transferring it to the general fund uh, to make those payments. And uh, I don't know, do we have, I don't think the board has voted to approve the priorities yet. So, uh, yeah, the, the planning commission have they brought their priorities for us? I, I have not seen them, and I think Richard has left. I I don't know that he had a quorum to to get it approved the last time I spoke to him. Do you he, know? he did not. That that was canceled last night. So, I feel the CIP right now is just really inclusive of our debt. And right. transfer for um, Travis Kuzenberg's salary and the 85000 that we give to uh, the service authority for their CIP. One of the things that and I haven't had a chance to thoroughly 
the, the CIP um, has to go through the Planning Commission first. Right. And so we need to see what they got, and then we can go forth with it. Right. Uh, but I think one thing you'll have to look at in the future, unless there's a significant increase in the uh, tonnage at the landfill, you're going to have to probably look at, at more of transferring some portion of your fund balance over there to support the capital improvement plan. Yes, sir. So there's been a lot of issues with we brought on the um, convenience sites. Supposed to save us twenty some thousand, and it was costing us a million dollars more a year. So there's a lot of things to work through that, and you and Mr. Stewart, um, landfill committee. So. We'll put that on the phone, well, White. Tell you all um, discuss it with um, waste management. Yeah. Some of the things that, uh, and you know, really doesn't do any good to complain about the rearview mirror. But there were some things that I was surprised that were approved and negotiated by others uh, with uh, waste management that probably was not in the best interest of the county. But unfortunately, it is what it is now. So I don't know if we can correct some of those or not. Okay. Thank Mr. you, Chairman. So we are having a landfill uh, committee meeting here on the 16th, if uh, I'm not mistaken. I would like to get with you and, and to see, um, you know, as a vice chairman, I'm going to have to uh, set the agenda because the chairman's unavailable. There are a lot of things to be discussed, so I'd like to get with you on that. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, I don't have anything else to add on that. Uh, oh, did I miss it? Uh, let's see. Wait a minute. Where am I? At? Uh, where did I? Where's that? Page two. Okay, on page two and page three, uh, we need to uh, request a transfer from the approval for the stabilization fund. Uh, to the capital improvement fund. Okay. Yes, that was to pay down the debt. That was the right. whole reason for that. Right. Um, the citizen center of fees, can we put that on the next agenda? We yeah. prepared for that? Yeah, I, I forgot to include all that. There was a lot of last minute stuff we were trying to get done. So there's a, an RFP for the assessor. Pardon me. The reassessment we need to have approval to go ahead and authorize the request for proposals and i don't know how you've done it in the past the way i've always done it i've had two board of supervisors member commissioner of revenue and then if you want to have a citizen member usually i sat in as county administrator well, selecting uh the vendor to do the reassessment the assessor so first we would need to agree or disagree to, to put an RFP out and then we can uh, go through who will be on it. So the reassessment by law board uh I think it's by the population of the county. I know it's no more than six, but I, I think there's a staggered number for counties and so forth. And in Westmoreland we did it every four years. Then when things slow down, we did it every six years. So it's my and, understanding it's been every four years, but you can do a reassessment. Oh, you, you, yeah, you could do it annually if you wished to do it. Right, but it, and there's a there's a cost to that. Right. Some counties, some counties do their own assessments, so they have their own people to do the assessments. And one thing I was thinking about is, <clears throat> I'm not suggesting that we we our people do, um, but I think differently to some people. So what I was thinking was, if we can talk to some of those counties that do it themselves, maybe get some lessons learned, how to do it smarter from them, mm -hmm. and and possibly if the people they have aren't fully engaged, work out some co-op. I don't know if we can do okay, that. Okay, well, let me, first of all, most of the jurisdictions would, that do it annually would be like probably Prince William and Rico, just the large jurisdictions where you have a lot of volume. And so, uh, but the, the one problem why it's so 
difficult to get people. You have to be a certified appraiser. Now, I'm not talking about like an appraiser doing residential property. You have to be certified and certified by the state tax department because they have a list of certified appraisers you have to choose from. And uh, my, my general experience, because I've actually calculated what it costs for people, to, of course, they're in an urban area, so it's kind of hard to adjust that comparison, but it actually costs more when you do it in-house than when you contract it out. Right, right. I, I was, I was, yeah, my, my, but I, was, I wasn't thinking about doing it in, saying we did it in-house. Right. I was, what I was thinking is other counties. Mm -hmm. Westmoreland, other counties have to do this. Yes. And they contract it out. Right. If four counties got together to co op. Yes. We, and we looked at that, the same thing you're thinking, we looked at that in our PDC. The problem was getting the alignment of when you had to do the reassessment and so forth. And actually, when we figured out the cost to get a certified appraiser and, and that, there wasn't much, one worth it. There wasn't much, the savings was very marginal. It was good. I mean, we looked at that idea and specifically. The advantages if, if, to it, to my mind, is if we had people that knew the four counties. Yeah. And and we're doing that because what we paid for one guy or for to have an assessment done, if it paid for us to have a guy in the counties did that, yeah. we have resident knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that resident knowledge is what would help with efficiency and accuracy and stuff. That's that's what I was thinking. But yeah. if, it, if it doesn't work, so then our next assessment is due next year. I don't. When did you have your last? I don't know when you had your last one done. It was. I think it was three years ago. I think it has to commence. Now it usually takes about a year. Then would go into effect in January, where the assessor would sign the book. And those would be your new number. Uh, if you go outline on the state tax department, uh, it has the, uh, the commissioner of revenue is required to submit all arm's length sales to the state tax department. They publish a sales ratio study. And I think the last one I looked at, they did was in, I think either 2018 or 19, because they're doing it statewide. So it takes them a long time you cannot drop below 70% of the fair market value. When you do that, you get the nasty gram from the state tax commissioner. Well, <clears throat> that's a problem because whenever they went way over, they didn't sound any alarms. <laughs> they don't care about that. They only care about the under. Uh, but I tell you, we had a problem when, was it 2007 or eight, when you had the crash and everything? We were doing our reassessment. Well, he kept having to do sales ratio studies uh, because the prices just kept shooting up. Well, of course, then when we signed the book and everything, then about a year later, I get the letter from the state tax commissioner because everything tanked. So we had to do it again within a year. And that's pretty expensive to do them back to back. But one thing I would suggest that you do here, I always put away what my estimate was going to be for six years or four years, I would put one port, either one fourth or one sixth of that away, but you just set it aside so you don't have to come up with it all at one time. That's a good good thing to add to your thing, Mr. Cobb. So, as that. So now our decision is who's going to sit on the board. You haven't made a decision that that's what we're going to do. Mr. Chair, excuse me. Um, in October of 2023, um, the board members had um, assigned a reassessment advisory committee. So they're supposed to, by resolution, help with um, finding a reassessment contractor in 2024 and then assisting with public notices and quality control of the reassessment contractor's work in 2025. And it says the 2025 real estate assessments would apply to property and calendar year of 2026. Who is the uh, board of supervisors and representatives on that committee? I think you appointed all of them. Isn't you know, the one Mr. Cheadle's on? No. Uh, that's, yeah. that's the uh, equalization. So this is supposed to be headed by the commissioner of revenue. Um, 
and then she has uh, about four or five already on that reassessment committee. So he's the only name I Is recommend. Is there a supervisor on that? No, not, so not to my Mr. knowledge. Stroud, would you like to be on that? We would probably have to make sure we have to amend the resolution. Well, let me let me explain. We when the, the county does the contract. It's the Board of Supervisors who's contracting, not the Commissioner of Revenue. And so, although I've always included them when you're interviewing them, but I think it's, uh, you know, the contract will be the contract between the Board of Supervisors and whomever the member. Yeah. That was my argument on the last board. I know. That's why I thought you'd be a good one to be on the committee. Anyhow, where we go from here, <laughs> I, I don't even know where we're at. So I, I would request that you all authorize us to put out an RFP for doing the uh, um, the reassessment for the required time period that we can put in the RFP. And then when we get those back, you can appoint a committee to go through that process and. Hopefully you have a county administrator by that time who can sit in on that meeting and go from there. Absolutely. I make a motion that we authorize Mr. Rizavi to take the action he just presented to us. Prepare. Let's see. Probably second. This, this probably has to be a vote by roll call, correct? Because it deals with finances. Well, but you're not, no, not because right now you're not. Okay. Uh, just, you're not authorizing, a, if he's authorizing a contract, yes. But right now you're just authorizing to uh, put the advertisement out for bid. Right, I would like to make a friendly amendment on this one due to, to make sure we do this correctly, is to have Mr. Rosavi and the finance staff put out the proper RFP for. Second. Aye. No more, any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 I didn't hear you, sir. Chair yeah, votes aye. Thank you. Um, so we'll we'll deal with the on the committee. Is there any other business before us? Wait a minute. The the CIP. Did you all approve the transfer from the stabilization? Did Jackie? Did they vote on that? The no. stable. We did not. No. Uh, so we need your approval on that. That would be a roll call. But it has to be a motion first. I make the motion that we make the transfer in the CIP of two million one hundred and thirty two thousand eight hundred and ninety dollars from the general account to the CIP stabilization. Stabilization. Fine. Second. Probably second. Any discussion? So I didn't. Was it that large? I thought it was three hundred thousand per budget cycle. I'm not, I didn't understand your question. We're talking about the debt mitigation. Yeah. So yeah, the debt mitigation currently has three hundred and eighty thousand dollars in that. That's totally different. The revenue okay. stabilization. I, I got it wrong. Okay. So is there any, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? No, it has to be roll call. Right. Not really, because you're not spending no. it. You're just. I, I just want to make sure I'm, we're learning this how to do this one. Roll the call. transfer. You're I don't not mind roll call on every single name. vote. Ms. Bender, go ahead. Uh, aye. Ms. Davis. Aye. Mr. Stroud. Aye. Mr. Sullivan. Aye. Mr. Chair votes aye. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. Chairman, if you can we get out our calendars, I don't know if everybody feels comfortable that we can go ahead and advertise this budget for a public hearing. And I need a date and time. I'm not familiar how you normally do that. If it's a, in Westmoreland, we always held a special meeting exclusively for that. I don't know if you do that or you do it part of your regular, however you do it. Well, I would imagine that there'll be a lot of feedback on the budget, so I would not put it on a board of supervisor night. Okay. Um, what's the so from when we advertise it the first time? We only have to advertise it once, I believe, and then 
the public hearing has to be seven days from that advertisement. Then once you hold the public hearing, then we have to wait seven days before you meet to adopt the budget and approve the tax rates. Right. And all the tax rates are remaining the same as what I'm proposing. So at this point, that all the budget is is a document to show the people where you intend to spend money. Right. It's not an appropriation to actually spend the money. That's correct. So it gives time for feedback of, of the public for the public hearing. So what is what? What? How far out? How many days from now? I do have to uh, publicize two weeks, two consecutive weeks. I think it's seven days from the date of. And Mr. Collins, we have to clarify that when we advertise a tax rate, you can't go up. You only can go down from that tax rate once it's advertised. So I just right. want everybody to know no, that. We're not advertising the tax rate. Okay, I'm just. Until it's appropriated, then you, at that meeting, then you would, then you would, um, you would put it on the tax rate. Right, but this budget is based on no raise in taxes. That's why I'm just trying to. We're just going to hold tight for a minute or two. Are we getting that taken care of over there? Find out when we get to the date. Don't know what part of it. So, Mr. Chairman, the only question I had was some of the questions that still are out to be answered. Are y'all allowed to change the budget? Let's just say you choose yes. the Wednesday that you advertise it from that Wednesday, are you allowed to change the budget? Yes. So nothing happens to an appropriation. Mm -hmm. So this is a budget we put out to the public. If there's things that uh, we, the public hearing or department has to have a, a different question, nothing happens till we appropriate it. This is just the, this is like a yearly budget for your, for your personal finances. You so haven't appropriated the money yet. So you're allowed to change the budget after you make the public hearing notice. So when is the last day you're allowed to change the budget from that day? Is the, the, that meeting you can change the budget? Is it, That's my question. Well, they can change the budget at any time, but if it's uh, an increase after that, then you've got to advertise the, it depends on what the amount is. If it's over 1% of what they approve of the budget, then you got to hold another public hearing. I appreciate that. Thank you. You have a question? Yeah, yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to clarify, I, was the um, the new county administrator, was it in this budget? You see it in the So that hasn't budget. been uh, finalized. So I think we should leave that on a, a sidebar conversation. But you're saying it was? I have budgeted for <laughs> a new county administrator. Okay, that's what I'll make sure. For a new county administrator. Right. Not a specific one. Yeah, exactly. There, sir, there are, um, with the other, the personnel matters that have been going on, the budget that we have now is going to support um, the way that our staff will be. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. The, the one position, it's not filled. I know you all want to discuss some different options, but that money is in the budget. But if you choose to do it by another manner, then you can do so. Awesome, sir. Thank you. All right. And Mr. Shava, I just want to, to clarify again for the public, it still leaves in a director of economic development. Yes. We're just waiting for the new county administrator to the come in. The position is still the position is still in the budget. I just want to, because there's been some question in the public, so I just wanted uh, to put that, that out there. That, that position is still there, and I'm assuming once you all hire your full-time county administrator, uh, he can work with you on whatever direction you choose to go. Okay. Yes, sir, Mr. Brown. You said no questions? Oh. All righty. So, was there a motion? I didn't recall hearing the exact motion. Do you have, do you have a date? Because uh, I'm going to be in public hearing. Yes. I'm going to be out of town on the. I'm leaving on the 19th, and I'll come back on the 22nd. Not that you need me here, but. 
And, and the 22nd won't work for me or Mr. Stroud either. We have to have seven days. We have to have seven days. Can't I think? Can't you participate if you're more than fifty miles away by? Uh, yeah, you can. I've done it before. Zoom or whatever. The question is, do you want to do that? Okay. All right. So let's come up with a date. How about the twenty fourth? Would the 24th give enough time? How soon exactly can you get it in the pre the Wednesday. Yeah, it's a Wednesday. I don't think we have a tight deadline. You know, they're making me move. My problem Would that meeting be a joint meeting with, with, with us also involved? That uh, I think that's how we did it last year. If memory serves me correct. So it really need no more input from the budget advisory hearing during the public hearing. Okay. Well, um, you can still give us input. Okay. Then. I'm sure you will. <laughs> Did y'all come up with a not date? Does May 24th oh. at April 24th at 5 30 p.m. in the boardroom. That's fine with me. Is everybody good with that? 5 30? Hold on. I'll make a motion that we advertise the budget as presented for April 24th at 8, 5 30 p.m. in the boardroom. For the public hearing. For the public hearing. Second. Probably second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Chairman, aye. aye. Thank you. Is there anything we need to schedule the date <laughs> to adopt, adopt it and lay the levy? And that date is what? Yeah. If possible. Um, May 8th, the week of the May 8th week. That would be the first day that we could do it. It has to be adopted by the 15th. But really, the sooner we can do it, is the better for the Commissioner of Revenue and Treasury. I'll make a motion. Do I have to make a motion? I just have to see if it works for the board. Isn't that the second public hearing? No, no. That's your meeting to adopt the budget okay. and, and lay the levy. Okay. I will make a motion to adopt the budget and lay the levy on uh, May 8th at 5.30 p.m. in the boardroom. Second. Probably second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Uh, for the record, when I was had my cell phone out looking at the budget book, I used it for the camera. 
so it could enhance my view. So there's be nothing for it to FOIA on that. Um, is there any other business before the board? One thing, I just want to thank Ms. Cobb's staff. Y'all have been amazing. This is the best budget I've ever seen. I worked on uh, last year's budget committee. This is a super strong budget considering there's no um, tax increases in it. There's a lot of savings. Y'all did amazing, amazing work. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Is there any other comments for the board? Board, do you have any comments? Real quick, um, Mr. Saab, I just want to say thank you so much. If there's one, it, a lot of people would have come in here in retirement, collected a paycheck, pilled around a little bit, and kind of <laughs> kind of made themselves. You came in and you put your nose to the ground. You really worked, and in my book, you're the definition of what a servant leader is. So thank you very much. So, Mr. Davis, he's not done with employment here. So that one done. I hope my wife's not watching. <laughs> yes, Ms. Cobb, thank you so much. So every question that was yeah. asked. LaVita has uh, been extremely responsive since day one of getting every piece of information I've asked for and her staff. Uh, I couldn't have asked for more because obviously I understand a lot of the accounts and so forth, but every county is a little bit different. So. I needed someone to help explain some things to me. Okay. I also want to acknowledge our admin staff that actually helped put these books together today because I was upstairs and they were hard at work and they got it done and it looked very nice. Thank you. Any other comments from the board? <clears throat> Seeing none. I'll make a motion to adjourn until Monday, April 15th at 5.30 p.m. in the boardroom. Second. Proper second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Chair Rosario, we are now adjourned. Yeah. Thank you. Am I, I going to